My name is Ed Flynn. I'm the City Council President. Viewers can watch the Council meeting live on YouTube by visiting boston.gov slash citycouncil-tv. I'd like to ask my colleagues and those in attendance to please silence your cell phones and electronic devices. Thank you. I'd also ask if we all can be respectful and um, not, do not disrupt the meeting while you are here. If you are disruptive, you will be asked to leave. And if you fail to comply, you will be escorted out. Please also note that according to city council rules, there are no signs allowed in the chamber. Mr. Clerk, will you please call the roll, roll to ascertain the presence of a quorum? Councilor Coletta. Yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Flaherty. Yeah. Councilor Flynn. Yeah. Councilor Lara. Yeah. Councilor Louis Jen. Yeah. Councilor Mejia. Yeah. Councilor Murphy. Yeah. And Councilor Worrell. Yeah. <laughs> quorum is present. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. I have been informed by the clerk that a quorum is present. This week's clergy is Peggy Hayes from Dignity Boston invited by Councillor Bach. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Councillor Braden. Um, I'd, ask, I'd like to ask Councillor Braden um, and Peggy Hayes from Dignity Boston to please come to the podium um, for our prayer today. Thank you, Mr. President. Good afternoon, everyone. It is afternoon. Um, as we celebrate the start of Pride Month in June, it is my honor today to introduce Peggy Hayes, who's a member of Dignity Boston. Uh, Dignity Boston is a faith community founded in 1972 for Catholics who are gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, intersex, or, and their families, friends, and allies. Dignity Boston liturgies are held at bo uh, by both ordained and lay members, and Peggy is a lay member who has been called by the community as one of its prayer leaders having been a member of Dignity for 30 years. The community meets for liturgy weekly, primarily online right now due to COVID, but also at St. Stephen's Episcopal Church in the Shawmut Avenue in the South End. In addition to offering weekly liturgy, welcoming all, uh, Dignity Boston is engaged in community through its co-founding in 1984 and continued co-sponsorship of a Friday night supper at the Arlington Street Church a meal program for anyone who, who needs a warm, healthy meal and a welcoming place to be. Dignity Boston participates in the AIDS Walk, Walk for Hunger, Breast Cancer Walk, Arthritis Walk, Harbour to the Bay, fundraising Ride for AIDS, Prevention and Treatment, and many other fundraising efforts. Dignity Boston has marched in every Pride March since its founding. Before finding a home at St. Uh, before finding a home at St. Stephen's Church, Dignity held its services at the Church of St. John the Evangelist in Beacon Hill and in Arlington Street Church. Peggy, uh, we want to thank you for joining the council today on behalf uh, of Big Dignity Boston, and would also like to present you um, uh, after you do your. Um, invocation will present you with a citation congratulating Dignity Boston on their 50th anniversary. And after the blessing, we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. And I'd also invite our, our, my colleagues to come and join Peggy and I and the President for a, photo, a quick photograph. I know we've got a big agenda, but for a quick photograph after the invocation. Thank you. It's all yours, Peggy. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon and thank you, Councillor Braden, for the invitation and for the honor to be with you today. A portion of the prayer I offer today is from the Celtic Christian tradition. Our Dignity Boston community frequently draws from the Celtic Christian tradition for its inclusivity and for its lack of emphasis on gender, two qualities that speak to the community of gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and intersex Catholics and our families and allies. Let us pray. O sun behind all suns, O soul behind all souls, we give you greeting this new day. Let all creation praise you. Let the daylight and shadows praise you. Let the fertile earth and the swelling sea praise you. Let the winds and rain 
The lightning and the thunder praise you. Let all that breathes praise you. And we shall praise you, O God of all life. We give you greeting this day. And we pray for the Boston City Council and the city and the people you serve today. May your minds be inspired. May your hearts yearn for justice. May your words be wise. May your strongest muscles lift the burdens of the vulnerable. May your ears hear the needs of the people, the city, and the planet. May your feet keep you moving forward. And may your work always be blessed. Amen. Amen. Um, please, please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance. Thank you, thank you, Peggy, and, and thank you, Council Braden. I would like to ask my colleagues if you could come up here for a for a photo, please. Do we stay up here? Yeah, we can stay up here. Thank you, Peggy, for that prayer, and thank you for the important work and leadership you are providing on civil rights issues across Greater Boston. Thank you, Peggy. Mr. Clark, please amend the attendance report to include Councilor Fernandez Anderson as being present. Mr. Clerk, please add Councilor Mejia as well. Now on to the first order of business, which is the approval of the minutes. <coughs> Seeing and hearing no discussion on the matter, the chair moves to approve the minutes from the last meeting as <laughs> presented. All those in favor of approving the meetings from the last meeting say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Thank you, the meeting, the minutes of the last meeting stand as approved. Communications from <coughs> Her Honor the Mayor. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 0707, please? Docket number 0707, message in order for your approval, a home rule petition to the general court entitled Petition for a Special Law, an act relative to certain affordable housing in the South Boston section of the city of Boston. The Chair recognizes Council Arroyo, Chair of the Committee on Government Ops. Council Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, Council President Flynn. Uh, as Chair of the Government Operations Committee, I seek suspension of the rules to vote on Docket 0707 today. Uh, this home rule petition seeks to allow the Boston Housing Authority to take part in the redevelopment of the Mary Ellen McCormick developments <coughs> using federal funds. Previous reforms to the Commonwealth's contract and procurement and award laws do not allow a path forward for the BHA to participate in this redevelopment effort. Without the BHA's development, this project would be struck with an overly structured sub-bid process, <coughs> meaning it would have a separate general contract and subcontractor <coughs> selection, and I believe this would not be a fair and transparent process for the city. In the past, the BHA has filed similar legislation, namely for the Whittier Street, Bunker Hill, Orchard Gardens, Mildred C. Haley, Orion Heights, and Franklin Hill family developments. Packets of passage of this docket today would ensure the residents of Mary Ellen McCormick a fair and transparent process while revitalizing the current development. Uh, 
due to the matter of urgency with the state legislature ending their sessions in July. As chair of government operations committee, I seek suspension of the rules to pass 0707 today so that we can get it up there before they end their session in July. Uh, but uh, I, I'm more than happy to, and I've been told by the administration, they're more than happy to, once we get to the procurement uh, process part of this, to have a hearing to discuss that path forward. But this allows them to do that. Thank you, Council President Flynn. Thank you, Council Royal. Council Royal seeks suspension of the rules. Okay. The chair recognizes Council Flaherty. Council Flaherty, the support uh, the chair in this effort. I, I served as uh, chair of government operations and led the effort to do the previous ones that he had mentioned. Also was born in the old Harbor Project, which is the Mary Ellen McCormick, uh, and that development is in dire need of, uh, of rehab and revitalization, as well as uh, the opportunity to build additional housing there. So uh, look forward to having this expedited and obviously get the briefing as soon as possible uh, to get the update as to where they stand. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you, Council Flaherty. The Chair recognizes Council Block. Council Block, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I just also wanted to rise in support of the uh, Chair's recommendation. Um, when I worked at the Housing Authority, I used to chase these specific types of home rule petitions through the State House, um, and they are totally critical to the revitalization of public housing. Um, it has to do with the fact that the, the law is written in a way where if you're Paving a road, great, and it's designed to help us get the lowest price on paving the road, but the kind of iterative process that we do with our housing communities around exactly how we want them to take shape, basically um, the su file subbed process prevents um, the kind of the kind of adjusting of the program over time that we want to see. So it's important for the um, housing authority to have the flexibility that the home rule petition creates. And I would say that it tends to take a little while to get them through the state legislature, so I think time is of the essence. Thank you. Thank you, Council Bach. The Chair recognizes Councilor Baker. Councilor Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I just rise in support of this. As you know, Mary Ellen McCormick is in my district. We've been talking about the, the, um, the redo of Mary Ellen McCormick for, for a couple of years now. This, this actually makes it real, so just wanted to show my support. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Baker. I'd also echo what Councilor Baker and Council Flaherty and my colleagues, Council Block as well, uh, Council Royal, um, and, but especially thanking Council Baker and Council Flaherty for the work you do with the residents in Mary Ellen McCormick. It's an important development, they're wonderful people, so I wanna say thank you to Council Baker, Council Flaherty, and the BHA team uh, for the important work that you're doing. Council Arroyo seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0707. All those, all those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 0708? Docket number 0708. Message in order authorizing the City of Boston acting through the Mayor's Office of Housing to apply for, accept, and expend the amount of $21,597,797 provided under the Home Investment Partnerships Program, American Rescue Plan, Home Art Act of 2021 from the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development. The purpose of the Home Art Funds is to provide housing to individuals, to households who are homeless, at risk of homelessness, and other vulnerable populations in the city of Boston. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Clark. Docket 0708 will be assigned to the Committee on Housing and Community Development. Mr. Clark, can you please read Docket 0709? Docket number 0709, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $34,309 in the form of a grant for the federal fiscal year 21 Paul Coverdell Forensic Science Improvement for Formula Allocation awarded by the United States Department of Justice, passed through Massachusetts State Police and Crime Laboratory to be administered by the Police Department. The grant will fund training and continuing education for forensic examiners, criminalists, and laboratory personnel. Thank you. The, the Chair recognizes Council Flaherty, Chair of the Committee on Public Safety, Criminal Justice, Council Flaherty. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, somewhat of a modest grant uh, for the Forensics uh, Division uh, and uh, looking forward to suspension and passage 
to get these very uh, necessary funds over to the lab. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Flaherty. Council Flaherty, seek suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0709. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 0710 and 0711 together, please? Docket number 0710, message in order authorizing the collector treasurer of the city of Boston to enter into a compensation balance agreement with Citizens Bank pursuant to the Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 44, Section 53F, for the provision of banking services as more fully described in the attached form. And docket number 0711, message in order authorizing the collector treasurer for the city of Boston to enter into a compensation balance agreement with J.P. Morgan Chase Bank, N.A., pursuant to Massachusetts General Law 44, Section 53F, for the provision of banking services as more fully described in the attached form. Thank you. <coughs> Docket 0710-0711 will be assigned to the Committee on Ways and Means. Mr. Clerk, can you please read Docket 0712-0719 together? Docket number 0712, notice was received from the City Council President Ed Flynn of the appointment of Councillor Kenzie Bach as the City Council Representative and Trustee to the Neighborhood Housing Trust for the 2022 calendar year. Docket number 0713, notice was received from the Mayor of the appointment of Christopher Radcliffe as Interim Purchasing Agent for the City of Boston, effective May 28, 2022. Docket number 0714, notice was received from the Mayor of the appointment of Ellen A. Hatch as a trustee of the Franklin Park Maintenance Trust Fund. Docket number 0715, notice was received from the Mayor of the appointment of Ellen A. Hatch as chairperson of the Franklin Park Maintenance Trust Fund. Docket number 0716, notice was received from the Mayor of the appointment of Julia Mejia as a trustee of the Neighborhood Jobs Trust Board of Trustees. Docket number 0717, notice was received from the Mayor of the reappointment of Trin Nguyen as a trustee of the Neighborhood Jobs Trust Board of Trustees. Docket number 0718, communication was received from Council President Ed Flynn regarding the 2022-2023 updated committee assignments. And docket number 0719, communication was received from Timothy J. Smith, Executive Director of the Boston Retirement Board regarding the fiscal year 23 reti retiree cost of living adjustment, also known as COLA vote. Thank you. Docket 0712-20719 will be placed on file. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0720. Docket number 0720, communication was received from the city clerk transmitting a communication from the Boston Landmarks Commission for the for City Council action on the designation of Petition 38 Highland Park Architectural Conservation District, Roxbury, Mass. In effect, after July 8th, 2022, if not acted upon. Thank you. Docket 0720 will be signed to the Committee on Planning, Transportation, Development. Mr. Clerk, please read Docket 0721. Docket number 0721. The count. Constable Bonds of James Darby, she, uh, Sheila Darby, William McKean, Michael Janus, J, uh, James Burke, Frank Kravitsky, Russell Castagna, George Reese, Lucia McLean, McLean uh, Robert Messina, Rob, Michael Lopes, William Doniger, Ma, uh, Mark Kravitsky, Gabriel Azubuke, and Joaquin Machando, Giovanni Colon, Derek Hughes, Tyrone Grant, Nicola Tritta, and Keith Hershenson has been duly approved and received by the Collector Treasurer. The, the Chair recognizes Council Flaherty. Council Flaherty, you have the floor. For suspension and passage of Docket 0721, uh, obviously service to process in the city is essential, and uh, these individuals obviously have been duly approved, and their livelihoods and businesses depend on it. Uh, asking for suspension and passage so we can get them uh, their licenses and get them out there. Thank you. Thank you. 
Docket, um, docket 0721 is approved under usual terms and conditions. Um, reports of committees, Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0487 to 0501 together, please. Take some more. Docket number 0487, the Committee on Ways and Means to which was referred on April 13th, 2022. Docket number, docket number 0487, message in order authorizing a limit for the Boston Public Schools revolving fund for fiscal year 2023 to support the maintenance and repair of BPS facilities, including custodial and utility costs for extending building time, floor refinishing, landscaping, and building repairs. Receipts from lease, permit for use, and parking fees for BPS facilities will be deposited in the fund. BPS will be the only unit authorized to expend from the fund, and such expenditures shall not exceed $2,200,000. Submits a report recommending that the order ought to pass. Docket number 0488, the Committee on Ways and Means to which was referred on April 13, 2022. Docket number 0488. Message in order authorizing a limit for the Boston Public Schools Revolving Fund for fiscal year 2023 for the Boston Public Schools transportation costs, including bus and public transportation costs. This revolving fund shall be credited with revenue received by Boston Public School Department for the provision of transportation to groups and entities for field trips and activities other than transportation to and from schools. Receipts and resulting expenditures from this fund shall not exceed $100,000. Submits a report recommending that the order ought to pass. Docket number 0489, the Committee on Ways and Means to which was referred on April 13, 2022. Docket number 0489, message in order authorizing a limit for the Boston Public Schools Revolving Fund for fiscal year 2023 to repair and purchase Boston Public Schools computer technology, including computers, mobile devices, and instructional software. This revolving fund shall be credited with any and all receipts from equipment sales and repair fees for Boston Public School technology. Receipts and res resulting expenditures from this fund shall not exceed $2 million. Submits a report recommending the order ought to pass. Docket number 0490. The Committee on Ways and Means to which was referred on April 13, 2022. Docket number 0490. Message in order authorizing a limit for the Boston Police Department revolving fund for fiscal year 2023 to support the K-9 units training program for officers and police dogs from non-City of Boston law enforcement agencies. The Special Operating Division will charge tuition and other fees to outside law enforcement agencies for the K-9 unit. The tuition and other fees by outside agencies will be used to purchase training equipment, certify instructors, update facilities, and provide funds for other training needs not otherwise budgeted. The Special Operations Division will be the only unit authorized to expend from the fund, and such expenditures shall be capped at $125,000 submits a report recommending that the order ought to pass. Docket number 0491, the Committee on Ways and Means to which was referred on April 13, 2022. Docket number 0491, message in order authorizing a limit for the Boston Police Department revolving fund for fiscal year 2023 to pay salaries and benefits of employees and to purchase supplies and equipment necessary to operate the Boston to operate the Police Department Fitness Center. Revenue for this fund is derived from monthly membership fees. Receipts and resulting expenditures from this fund shall not exceed $125,000. Submits a report recommending that the order ought to pass. Docket number 0492. The Committee on Ways and Means to which was referred on April 13, 2022. Docket number 0492. Message in order authorizing a limit for the Boston Centers for Youth and Families revolving fund for fiscal year 2023 to pay salaries and benefits of employees and to purchase supplies and equipment necessary to operate the City Hall child care. 
This revolving fund shall be credited with any and all receipts from tuition paid by parents or guardians for children enrolled at the center. Receipts and resulting expenses from this fund shall not exceed $900,000. Submits a report recommending that the order ought to pass. Docket number 0493, the Committee on Ways and Means to which was referred on April 13, 2022. Docket number 0493. Message in order authorizing a limit for the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture Revolving Fund for fiscal year 2023 to purchase goods and services to support the operation of the Strand Theater. This revolving fund shall be funded by receipts from rental fees for the use of the Strand Theater. The Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture will be the only unit authorized to expend from the fund and such expenditures shall be capped at $300,000, submits a report recommending that the order ought to pass. Document number 0494, the Committee on Ways and Means to which it was referred on April 13, 2022. Document number 0494, message in order authorizing a limit for the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture Revolving Fund for fiscal year 2023 to purchase goods and services to support public art to enhance the public realm throughout the city of Boston. This revolving fund shall be funded by receipts from easements within the public way granted by the Public Improvement Commission. The Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture will be the only unit authorized to expend from the fund and such expenditures shall be capped at $120,000. Submits a report recommending the order ought to pass. Docket number 0495, the Committee on Ways and Means to which was referred on April 13, 2022. Docket number 0495, message in order authorizing a limit for the Mayor's Office of Tourism revolving fund for fiscal year 2023 to purchase goods and services to support events and programming on and around City Hall Plaza to advance tourism and promote participation in public celebrations, civic and cultural events. This revolving fund shall be funded by receipts from payments for the use of City Hall Plaza pursuant to City of Boston Code Ordinance 11-7.14. The Mayor's Office of Tourism will be the only unit authorized to expend from the fund, and such expenditures shall be capped at $150,000. Submits a report recommending the order ought to pass. Docket number 0496, the Committee on Ways and Means to which was referred on April 13, 2022. Docket number 0496, Message in order authorizing a limit for the Law Department Revolving Fund for fiscal year 2023 to purchase goods and services for repairs to city property. This revolving fund shall be funded by receipts from recoveries for damages to city property caused by third parties. The Law Department will be the only unit authorized to expend from the fund and such expenditures shall be capped at $300,000. Submits a report recommending that the order ought to pass. Docket number 0497, the Committee on Ways and Means, on Ways and Means to which was referred on April 13, 2022. Docket number 0497, message in order authorizing a limit for the Distributed Energy Resource Revolving Fund for fiscal year 2023 to facilitate the purchase of os offsets of greenhouse gas emissions, which shall be associated with a portion of the electricity consumed by the city annually and to operate, maintain, monitor, and expand the city's existing solar arrays and Boston Public Schools combined heat and power facilities. This revolving fund will, uh, shall be credited with any and all receipts from the sale of renewable and alternative energy certificates and demand response program revenues produced by combined heat and power units located at Boston Public School sites and solar renewable energy certificates produced by the city's photovoltaic arrays. Re receipts and resulting expenditures from this fund shall not exceed $150,000. Submits a report recommending that the order ought to pass. Docket number 0498, the Com Committee on Ways and Means to which was referred on April 13, 2022. Docket number 0498, message in order authorizing a limit for the environment Conservation Commission revolving fund for fiscal year 2023 for the purpose of securing outside consultants 
including engineers, wetland scientists, wildlife biologists, and other experts in order to, in, to aid in the review of proposed projects to the commission per the city's ordinance protecting local wetland and promoting climate change adaptation. The revolving fund shall be funded by receipts from the fees imposed by the commission for the purpose of securing outside consultants. The Environment Department, department will be the only department authorized to expend from the fund, and such expenditures shall be capped at $50,000. Submits a report recommending that the order ought to pass. Docket number 0499, the Committee on Ways and Means to which was referred on April 13, 2022. Docket number 0499, message in order approving an appropriation of $500,000 from the city's Boston Equity Fund to create special revenue project grant in order to support equity applicants and licensees as defined by the equity program and to establish and operate a cannabis business in the city of Boston. The fund shall be credited to the special revenue grant fund from the Boston Equity Fund established pursuant to City of Boston Ordinance, Ordinances Chapter 8, Section 13, establishing the equitable regulation of the cannabis industry in the city of Boston. Submits a report recommending the order ought to pass. Docket number 0500. The Committee on Ways and Means to which was referred on April 13, 2022. Docket number 0500. Message in order approving an appropriation of $4,560,000 from the 21st Century Fund, also known as the Public Educational or Government PEG Access and Cable Related Fund, pursuant to Section 53F. Uh, three quarters of chapter 44 of the general laws to the PEG access and cable related grant for cable related purposes consistent with the franchise agreement between the cable operator and the city including but not limited to one supporting public educational governmental access cable television services two monitoring compliance of cable operator with the franchise agreement or three preparation of renewal of the franchise license submits a report recommending the order ought to pass. And docket number 0501, the Committee on Ways and Means to which was referred on April 13, 2022. Docket number 0501, message in order authorizing the appropriation of $1,400,000 from the income of the George Francis Parkman Fund. The funds are to be expended under the direction of the Commissioner of Parks and Recreation for the maintenance and improvement of Boston Common and Parks in existence since January 12, 1887. Submits a report recommending that the order ought to pass. Thank you, Mr. Clark. The Chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson, Chair of the Committee on Ways and Means. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. These dockets represent revolving funds and other annual appropriations that are related to the city's budget, <coughs> including the Parkman Fund, PEG, Access Fund, and the Equity Fund. We heard some of these funds together with the relevant departments and received testimony on all of them. These are standard annual appropriations and are sources of exter external funding that don't come from the city's tax dollars. So I recommend passage of all 15 dockets. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Uh, we will now take a vote on each of these dockets separately. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, the chair of the Committee on Ways and Means seeks acceptance of the committee report in, do in passage of docket 0487. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Council Fernandez Anderson, the chair of the Committee on Ways and Means, seeks acceptance of the committee report, passage of docket 0488. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. The ayes have it, the docket has passed. Council Fernandez Anderson, the chair of the Committee on Ways and Means, seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 0489. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. The ayes have it, the docket has passed. Council Fernandez Anderson, the chair of the committee, on Ways and Means seeks acceptance of the committee report, passage of docket 0490. All, all those in favor say aye. Aye. 
No opposed, nay, the ayes have it. The docket is passed. Council Fernandez Anderson, the chair of the Committee on Ways and Means, seeks acceptance of the committee report. Passage of docket 0491. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Council Fernandez Anderson, the chair of the Committee on Ways and Means, seeks acceptance of the committee report. Passage of docket 0492. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Council Fernandez Anderson, the chair of the Committee on Ways and Means, seeks acceptance of the committee report. Passage of docket 0493. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Council Fernandez Anderson, the chair of the Committee on Ways and Means, seeks acceptance of the committee report. Passage of docket, docket 0494. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Council Fernandez Anderson, the chair of the Committee on Ways and Means, seek, seeks acceptance of the committee report. Passage of docket 0495. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Council Fernandez Anderson, the chair of the Committee on Ways and Means, seeks acceptance of the committee report. Passage of docket 0496. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Council Fernandez Anderson, the chair of the Committee on Ways and Means, seeks acceptance of the committee report. Passage of docket 0497. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Council Fernandez Anderson, the chair of the Committee on Ways and Means, <coughs> seeks acceptance of the committee report. Passage of docket 0498. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Council Fernandez Anderson, the chair of the committee. Ways and Means seeks acceptance of the committee report. Passage of docket 0499. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Council Fernandez Anderson, the chair of the committee on Ways and Means seeks acceptance of the committee re report. Passage of docket 0500. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Council Fernandez Anderson, the, the chair of the committee on Ways and Means <coughs> seeks acceptance of the committee report. Passage of docket 0501. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. The docket has passed. Before we go on to matters recently heard for possible action, which are the, the budget, which are the budget votes, <coughs> I want to take docket 0722 out of order, which is a hearing order from Council Coletta, and she will be making her maiden speech. Yeah. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0722 into the record. Docket number 0722, Councilor Coletta offer the following. Order for a hearing regarding a comprehensive district-wide planning process for Boston's waterfront. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Councilor Coletta. Councilor Coletta, you have the floor. Thank you, Council President Flynn. Today, I rise proudly for the first time with excitement, optimism, and endless love for the city and its people. I am hopeful for the future we can and will create for future generations with creativity and innovation. And while I'm incredibly excited for the future of this city, I am keenly aware of the unique challenges ahead. And as we look directly into the face of what is a local threat to us and millions around the world, sea level rise due to climate change, I am worried about our future. The progress we've built, both in our physical infrastructure as well as in our human infrastructure, through the dismantling of oppressive systems and structures, will all be for naught if we do not plan proactively to protect the resiliency of our coastline and of our people. And so today, in thinking of our collective future, I rise with urgency. And I rise with the intention to expedite the conversation in implementing a comprehensive district-wide planning process for Boston's waterfront. Boston is extremely lucky to have a natural and environmental treasure that is our harbor. Many forget that Boston has a rich historic maritime history, even before the settlement of European colonizers on indigenous, indigenous Massachusetts land. As Boston grew, so did its shipping ports and piers, and with that, the waterfront became a necessary economic engine during the industrial era. 
And over the years, as the city expanded, contracted, and expanded again, our waterfront has remained an industrial hub while also enjoying welcomed investments into beautiful parks and open spaces on the water's edge. I think of places that I frequented as a child with my abuela, like parks uh, including Pierce Park or Park Azul as it's known in the Latinx community, and the iconic La Presti Park with sweeping views of Boston's skyline. We all have the right to access and enjoy Boston's tidelands protected by the Public Waterfront Act, otherwise known as Chapter 91. But despite these protections, and much like any jewel, our beloved waterfront is under intense pressure, both due to coastal flooding and private interests that seek to commodify its beauty. District 1 in particular faces pressures as East Boston, Charles Sound, and the North End are all, are all coastal communities that for generations have bared significant burdens and in environmental injustices. We face being hit first and worst by negative impacts of climate change in the coming years, and the data is out there and it's unsettling. The Gulf of Maine, including its smaller cousin, Massachusetts Bay, is the fastest warming body of ocean on the planet. Boston faces the greatest risk of flooding with more than 45% of our critical, critical infrastructure at risk, and this includes our hospitals, schools, police, and fire stations. And it is expected to increase by 20% by 2051. And as we prepare for sea level rise, we must prioritize waterfront planning that dictates any new development while incorporating a strong plan for resiliency, equity, and accessibility. And right now, in this very moment, we are dealing with a compounding displacement crisis, both due to development and gentrification. And then looking to the very near future, about 11,000 people, a majority of them low income and people of color, will soon be displaced due to coastal flooding. And the city has a significant role to play in planning for our future to fortify our coastline and mitigate the effects of storm surges and stormwater runoff which is a whole nother topic that we'll get to at a later date. But yes, we can achieve this without depending on investments from private entities or developers whose goal it is to maximize their financial return under the guise of resiliency if it does so please the bureaucrats that it ultimately needs approval from. I rise today to strongly say taking a parcel by parcel approach to fortifying, fortifying our coastline has not and will not adequately address the urgent need of coastal flooding, nor does it consider the need for a holistic plan to solve our housing crisis. I am pleased to see the recent announcement by Mayor Michelle Wu to launch an MHP for East Boston that prioritizes waterfront resiliency and equity, and I do look forward to partnering with her administration on this work. But while we consider next steps for this process, there are significant lessons to be learned from the downtown waterfront MHP that occurred between 2013 and 2017 in both the plan itself and community engagement. First, we must be able to meet the sea to take in water by using both passive and active permeable landscape, landscapes. Let's utilize contemporary resiliency strategies seen around the world as applied in cities in Amsterdam, Rotterdam, and in Venice. I know Boston is a competitive city, so I hope when I say that we are behind the pack on this, it will dawn on, pe it will dawn on people that we are behind and that we seriously need to act urgency, urgently. Collaboration is key with academic partners like the UMass Boston Stone Living Lab, which is already analyzing the merits of large engineering solutions to sea level rise with social justice at the center of decision making. And then whatever happens to this process, it needs to be community led. We need to have an emphasis on centering the needs of residents for what their vision is for their waterfront. And my last point on this is that we must plan for the inclusion of all Bostonians to enjoy the waterfront, regardless of race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. We should ensure that there are wayfinding signs, this is easy, available in multiple languages, uh, and we should work with the Coalition for a Resilient and Inclusive Waterfront and waterfront-dependent institutions like the New England Aquarium to assist us with affordable programming. I'd also like to see living shorelines that act as classrooms for BPS and even community-based organizations like the Harbor Keepers and Green Roots. And there is an economic argument to this as well. I've seen reports that state that for every dollar spent today on waterfront planning, fortifying our coastlines, we will save $4 
per square foot of buildings impacted by coastal flooding. So as there are parallel planning processes taking place in my district and increased discussions around lifting certain waterfront properties uh, under the designated port area, we need a plan that takes into consideration modern resilient strategies through an equity lens that sets out our vision to guide any new proposals. We simply cannot perpetuate a piecemeal approach any longer and hope we are protected in the coming years. I'll close just by saying that as a young girl, I often dreamed about uh, accessing the entirety of East Boston's waterfront. I would walk along with my family along the water's edge and I used to try to jump high enough or get on the shoulders of my father to get a full glimpse of the skyline. I only ever knew the green fencing erected by Massport to keep people off of their property and away from the water. In hindsight, of course, now I realize that I was trying to overcome literal and metaphorical barriers to access the many missed opportunities or memories the water could have provided for me. And while we've made considerable progress and opened up a large part of the Harbor Walk due to luxury developments, there are significant lessons to be learned and missed opportunities. I never could have imagined that today I'd walk the same sidewalks as a child only to feel like what was built under the guise of resiliency was out of reach financially for me and for the people that I love. Or that five years later, we'd still have trouble accessing protections allotted to us under Chapter 91. I want to give a shout out to Magdalena Ayed of the Harbor Keepers, who is making sure that the one bathroom we got in negotiations is still accessible to the public. It's time for that holistic and comprehensive approach. The urgency of climate change and private commodification requires us to be bold and to act now. But I am hopeful that we will rise to the occasion and we will take this challenge head on. Let's dream of a waterfront together. For us, those we know in our lifetime, and those that will inherit the dangerous realities of climate change in their lifetimes. And so today, I rise with urgency and with a call to action for us to meet this moment and get it right. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Council Coletta, for that wonderful maiden speech and welcome, welcome aboard. Um, is anyone else looking to speak on this matter? I don't think we could top that speech even <laughs> if we tried. Um, would anyone like to add their name? Please raise your hand. Mr. Clerk, um, please add Councilor Arroyo, Councilor Baker, Councilor Bach, Councilor Braden, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Lara. Council Lara, Council Lujan, Council Mejia, Council Murphy, Council Worrell, please add the chair. Docket, docket 0722 will be assigned to the Committee on Planning, Development, Transportation. <clears throat> Matters recently heard for possible action. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 04802. 0486 together, please. Document number 0480, message in order for the annual appropriation and tax order for fiscal year 2023, filed in the office of the city clerk on April 11, 2022. Docket number 0481, message in order for the annual appropriation for the school department for fiscal year 2023 filed in the office of the city clerk on April 11th, 2022. Docket number 0482. Message in order approving an appropriation of $40 million to the other post-employment benefits, also known as OPEP Liability Trust Fund, established under Section 20 of the Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 32B, filed in the office of the city clerk on April 11th, 2022. Docket number 0483. Message in order approving an appropriation of $1,600,000 from the city's capital grant fund to address the impact of 
transportation network services on, on municipal roads, bridges, and other transportation infrastructure, or any other public purpose substantially related to the operation of transportation network services in the city. Such funds will be transferred and credited to the capital grant fund from the revenue received from the Commonwealth Transportation Infrastructure Enha Enhancement Trust Fund filed in the office of the city clerk on April 11th, 2022. Docket number 0484, message in order authorizing the city of Boston to enter into one or more leases, lease purchase or installment sales agreements in fiscal year 2023 in, in, in an amount not to exceed $36 million. These funds are to be used for, by various city departments for the acquisition of equipment in furtherance of their respective governmental functions. The list of equipment includes computer equipment, hardware and software, motor vehicles and trailers, ambulances, firefighting equipment, office equipment, telecommunications equipment, photocopying equipment, medical equipment, school and educational equipment, school buses, parking meters, street lighting installation, traffic signal equipment, and equipment functionally related to and components of the foregoing. Filed in the office of the city clerk on April 11th, 2022. And docket number 0485. Message in order approving an appropriation of uh, $550,370,000 for the acquisition of interest in land or the acquisition of assets or the landscaping, alteration, remediation, rehabilitation, improvement of public land, the construction, reconstruction, rehabilitation, improvement, alteration, remodeling, enlargement, demolition, removal, or extraordinary repairs of public buildings, facilities, assets, works, or infrastructure, for the cost of feasibility studies or engineering or architectural services for plans and specifications for the development, design, purchase, and installation of computer hardware or software and computer-assisted integrated financial management and accounting systems. In any and all cost incidental or related to the above described projects for the purposes of various city departments, including Boston Center for Youth and Families, Department of Innovation and Technology, Environment, Fire, Neighborhood Development, Office for Arts and Culture, Parks and Recreation, Police, Property Depart Property Management, Public Works and Transportation Departments, Boston Public Library, Boston Redevelopment Authority and Public Health Commission, filed in the Office of the City Clerk on April 11, 2022. Docket number 0486. Message in order approving an appropriation of 138 million five $135,000 for the acquisition of interest in land or the acquisition of assets or the landscaping alt alteration, remediation, re rehabilitation, or improvement of public land, the construction, reconstruction, rehabilitation, improvement, alteration, remodeling, enlargement, demolition, removal, or extraordinary repairs of public buildings, facilities, assets, works, or infrastructure for the cost of feasibility studies or engineering or architectural services for plans and specifications, for the development, design, purchase, and installation of computer hardware or software and computer-assisted integrated financial management and accounting systems, in any and all cost incidental or related to the above described projects for the purposes of the Boston Public Schools filed in the office of the city clerk on April 11th, 2022. Thank you. Okay. The chair recognizes Council Fernandez Anderson, chair of the committee on ways and means. <laughs> Council Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Thank you, Councilor um, President Flynn. Uh, Mr. President, I'd like to request that we move docket 0480 to the end of the list and take dockets 0481 to 0486 first. With the council's um, indulgence, I will speak on all dockets collectively and then return to remarks on individual dockets. Um, you should have all of, uh, you should have five committee reports at your desks. 
Yes, that's 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 fine. Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. You have the floor. Thank you. Um, well, it's been quite a, a budget process, um, but here we are with some daylight before us. We have all done a lot of work over the last couple of months, and I salute all of you and your passion and patience. Before I go any further, I want to shout out to my team, uh, to whom, uh, who were integral to getting us to this point. My sincerest gratitude to Amina Scott, Joshua McFadden, Aline Mercury, and Kalamu Kieta for working so hard behind the scenes, which allowed me to properly outface with you guys. <coughs> A huge thank you to Michelle Goldberg. Where's Michelle? Yes, it's <laughs> for her efficiency, tenacity, humility, and professionalism. Thank you to Carrie Jordan, Juan Lopez, Lorraine Scatino, Ashley Vassell, Candace Morales, Ron Cobb, Christine, Megan, Julady, and of course, especially Ms. Cora Montron for all that they do in keeping us informed and making this process work. And now for, um, Boston Public Schools, um, for our Boston Public Schools. Um, I feel they need to continue, in order to continue in order uh, for us to, or our support in order for them to continue. Um, yes, there are improvements to be made and discussions to be had, but our students have a variety of needs and you don't meet these needs by reducing a budget. And yet, there is surely work to be done. We need to continue to diversify our teachers' workforce. Our schools are predominantly students of color, while our teachers are still largely white. It is imperative that our black and brown youth see more pedagogies and who look like them and who have lived in the experiences that are inter integral to their lives. Additionally, all of our youth need more mental health support, more addiction counselors, more librarians, more art teachers, more music teachers, more after school programs, and more athletic opportunities. So let us support our most precious resource, our young, by funding and supporting the schools they attend in an appropriate manner. I realize that some of my council colleagues um, and historically have um, uh, rejected without prejudice, and I welcome uh, conversations and comments um, again, I reemphasize that we have much work to do in order to, uh, for BPS to bring um, their services up to standard, the standards that our young deserve. Um, and again, welcome your comments. Um, docket 0481 is one of the several dockets that comprise the city's total operating budget and is a pro an appropriation order for BPS for FY23 in the amount of $1.33 billion. This FY23 budget includes a $400 million increase in funding over FY22 to exceed the third year of three, to exceed the year of three year, $100 million commitment made to Boston schools in 2020. Investments in FY23 operating budget include 6.6 .6 million for new social workers, school psychologists, and guidance counselors to build out coordinated, multi-tiered systems of support for students and their families. 26.7 million directly to schools to ensure equitable access to vital student programs and services. 5.5 million to expand access to libraries and invest in inclusive library collections and materials. 6.8 million in operations, improvements, and expanded organizational capacity for transportation, food, and nutrition services, and facilities maintenance repairs. 3.8 million to increase access to mass core at the secondary level and access to more physical education, art, music, and academic enrichment creating high quality, rigorous, and ethically and culturally responsive curriculum and instruction. And 2.6 million to expand language access with translations and interpretations for school meeting and materials. 
The FY23 operating budget also includes a proposed $16 million increase for charter school students, totaling public education funding for FY23 at $1.6 billion. Public education spending remains over 40% of the city's budget and per pupil spending at BPS will reach $27,100, an increase of $3,600 over last year. And so, as chair of Ways and Means, I recommend that this docket ought to pass. Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. Would anyone else like to speak on this docket? And this is docket 0481. The chair recognizes Councilor Mejia. Councilor Mejia. No, that's okay. I'm going to go with Councilor Mejia. Um, Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. And I thank you to the chair for shepherding us through such a whirlwind of budget conversations. And one of the things that I always kept saying in the BPS budget hearings is, don't bring me any more PowerPoints, and you hold them accountable to making sure that they talked about the return on investment. So really do appreciate your leadership in that space. And I'm not here just only as the chair of education, but also a BPS graduate and a BPS parent. And everyone in politics likes to talk about what, um, you know, the critical moment that we happen to find ourselves in or major turning points, and it tends to get overused, but when it comes to BPS, it's really true. Think about all of the upcoming changes going on in our Boston Public Schools. We're working towards creating a, an elected school committee. We're expecting a new superintendent, and of course, the issues of state receivership still looms over our heads. So all eyes are on BPS at this moment. And while the chaos and the politics happens at the top, it's the people at the bottom who are experiencing the ripple effects of our decisions. I know this because our office has visited and spoken with educators and students from across the district. We have seen firsthand how our educators are working their magic in classrooms to mold a generation of compassionate, curious, and well-rounded students. To go from those schools, seeing educational excellence at work, to going to BPS administration budget hearings can give you a little bit of whiplash because there always seems to be a disconnect between the decisions that are being made up top and the impact that those decisions have on everyone else. Overall, what we are um, spending our tax dollars on this year in BPS is in alignment with the goals that we have for our students. We're seeing more money for EL students, more money for special education. Few schools are seeking a decrease, um, are seeing a decrease in funding. And when we went out and spoke to educators and students across the district, many of their concerns from mental health to other support services are seeing an increase in funding this year. With that being said, there are still a number of areas that are of concern to me. When it comes to capital planning, we need to see greater strategic vision. In cases like the Shaw School, we still don't have a, dis a decided upon plan on how to support the sixth grade um, option there. I'm also not satisfied with how we're using our equity and opportunity gap tools to make decisions for our district. There are lots of areas that we can do better. The funding is there, but it's never a matter of how much money we're spending. I want to stand up here and say that we need to see more investments in this or that, but at this point, it's not a matter of investment. So I want to be clear that I'm planning on voting in favor of the BPS budget. Absolutely. Um, but I don't think it's fair to say that someone who votes against the budget is opposing public education, and someone who votes in favor of the budget is in favor of doing business as usual. So I just think it's really important for us to, to recognize, you know, that this moment is crucial. And as the chair of education, I take that um, role to heart. And I'm looking forward to this year, really looking at how we can support our Boston Public Schools um, to get to where they need to be, but it's gonna take all of us working together to make that happen. And so I am supporting the passage of the BPS budget with the caveat of knowing that I'm gonna be watching it as a hawk 
for the next year, um, but also holding myself accountable to what we need to do as a council to support them in achieving their goals. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Mejia. The chair recognizes Council Murphy. Council Murphy, you have the floor. Thank you, Councilor Flynn. Um, so I stand, as you all know, as a former BPS teacher, student, and parent. Um, but I don't have many good reasons to pass this $1.33 billion school budget. Our return on investment is low, with declining enrollment, poor reading levels, an increase in violence and the inability year after year to properly service our most vulnerable students who are on IEPs and receive ESL services. Those were my students for many years. We even struggle with the basic operations such as transportation and food services. And we all know how I feel about the dismal amount we invest in our school athletics, which, if properly funded, can provide the opportunity for so many of our children to participate in team sports and build the physical and mental health that, and strength that we know they need. And you mentioned, Councillor Anderson, that they've increased to $27,000 per student, more than that, and we're still spending less than $100 per student on athletics. I also struggle with the lack of transparency at BPS. I've asked questions time and time again in the six months I've been here on the council. In most time, those questions are half answered or ignored entirely. Moving forward, there is a need for accountability, transparency, and oversight in our Boston public school system. I will continue to always advocate for our teachers who I know show up every day and work so hard, and many of the administrators. I'll always advocate for our families and always put our children first. <clears throat> Every child in the city of Boston deserves a quality education. And there are so many moving parts right now in BPS that make this more challenging. There's the possibility of receivership, Council meetings are happening now around switching to an elected school committee, and we have an outgoing superintendent who's leaving in a few weeks. The finalists will be announced next week, and possibly a vote on June 22nd, and we'll know who our new superintendent is going to be. And that superintendent is going to be tied to this budget. And we know that Superintendent Casilius and her staff who were leading these budget proposals will not be there on July 1st. So the timing of this budget would be more reasonable, I believe, if we named the superintendent first. But I know that we have time constraints here on the council. So I wanted to share my concerns and hear from any other councils, councilors, so thank you. Thank you, Councilor Murphy. The chair recognizes Council Worrell. Council Worrell, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn, and thank you to Councilor Anderson for leading us through this budget process. Um, as student enrollment is declining, I'm encouraged with the new initiatives and the investments BPS will be making into our students this year. Uh, while we have heard about all the great programs and new investments, we have not heard data on literacy rate, post-secondary success, or how our students do in the job market. As a council, we do not have a clear understanding of BPS goals for our students. What our students' outcome, what student outcomes we are driving towards? Do we know the academic baseline of our students? With so many high school graduations taking place this time of year, it is important for us to ask how BPS is preparing our students for success after high school. What data shows that our children are ready for college, a trade, a certificate program, or a job? We are spending $1.33 billion without the ability to evaluate and validate the curriculum, programs, and initiatives to ensure we are preparing our students for life after high school. How many of our students graduate college? How many of our students go, to, go into trades? What is, the, what is a BPS education worth in the real world? Do we know the average salaries of our high school graduates? In 2016, so data, our graduate's average salary was around $37,000 a year. This is the most recent data I found, and it is old data, but that's the issue. We can change the outcome, we cannot change the outcome if we do not have the information readily available. If making a livable wage is important, we need to be tracking that information, 
making the necessary changes in BPS to prepare our students for a college or a career. We do not need to wait for a superintendent to tell us that um, our students need to prepare for life after high school. We can start that infrastructure building right now by being transparent with our student data, setting benchmarks, identifying metrics, and working with trusted partners who are evaluating and val validating student data. Although there is still work to be done, I'm grateful for and confident in the collaboration and creation when it comes to data. So I'll be voting yes for the student, uh, for the BPS budget. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Council Earl. Anyone else like to speak on this matter? Council Fernandez Anderson, the chair of the. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't see. You. Um, the chair recognizes Council Coletta. Council Coletta, you have the floor. Thank you, Council President. Uh, I just wanted to go on record uh, to give a statement. So we all know uh, the woes faced by BPS right now due to generational divestments and mismanagement, but I won't repeat them. What I will say is that as a BPS graduate, I know how strong our kids, families, and teachers are, especially with what they've gone through uh, the past couple years during the pandemic. Um, I believe the BPS community is resilient, and I believe in what public education can do to transform the lives of our children. I will also say that I do not support any top-down approach, and I still have yet to see the receipts. So given this, I still have great concerns about adequate supports for English language learners and children with special needs. I also want to see an investment in my O'Donnell School Playground in East Boston that serves 88% of Latinx kids who do not otherwise have access to open space in their community. I also believe that increases in central office budget should be reallocated to go directly to our classrooms to recruit and retain excellent teachers and paraprofessionals enhance healthy learning environments, and improve and modernize our curriculums to give our kids the best shot at success in the 21st century. And despite this, I'm going to support the chair's recommendation to pass the BPS budget. We as a family, including the mayor, the school committee, and the new superintendent, whoever she may be, can get this done. So I will go on record in support of passing this BPS budget and look forward to the conversations ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Council Coletta. The chair recognizes Councilor Braden. Councilor Braden, you have the floor. Mr. President, um, this morning I had the very great pleasure of visiting the Baldwin Early Learning Pilot Academy in Brighton, a diverse inclusion uh, school providing our youngest students with a solid foundation for their future learning within Boston Public Schools. I am so impressed and grateful to all the teachers and staff who work every day to support our students and our school community across the city for their tenacity, their resilience, and their, their stick to itness. Our public schools are in a competitive market to attract and retain students, and it is vitally important that we, in, uh, and, as, and so I stand to appeal, uh, stand and ask us that we invest in early learning and literacy to ensure that our youngest students get the foundation that they need to succeed right from the very start. If students begin, in early, early education in our school system they will, and BPS system, they will continue and those families will be engaged and invested in our, in our public school system in Boston. I want to echo, echo my colleague, uh, Councillor Worrell's concern about outcomes. How prepared are our students to enter the 21st century workforce? Uh, I also want to raise up the issue of uh, access to athletics. I firmly believe that uh, athletic programming in schools is a mental health support that our students vitally need, having weathered this uh, unprecedented uh, pandemic that we've just come through for the last two years. As the councillor for Alston Brighton, District 9, I also want to stand and, and uh, advocate for uh, a robust and uh, planning process for, the, uh, for a, a new Jackson Man Elementary School and for a new Horace Mann School for the Deaf, which is a regional school for the deaf with a 150 year history of excellence. Um, and I, I hope that we can continue to uh, support our uh, special ed students across the city uh, and our English language learners also. Um, it's, it's so inspiring when I visit a classroom and see the work of our students and our teachers every day. And I, although I have very 
grave concerns about the state of things in the Boston Public Schools. I will be dis in voting to support this budget today, but I do realize that we have a lot of work to do. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Braden. The Chair recognizes Councillor Arroyo. Councillor Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, Council President Flynn. Uh, I want to take a second to uh, thank Councillor Fernandez-Anderson for her inaugural budget and shepherding us through this uh, the first time for everybody with the amendments and all the changes that uh, we've done to the budget process in the last year. So thank you very much for your leadership and for putting in the hours uh, to get us here. Uh, I also want to take a moment to thank our educators. Uh, it has been an incredibly difficult two years for our teachers. Uh, my sister is a teacher right now teaching in a Boston public school. And my mother did so for 35 years, and so I got a first-hand seat uh, at watching her grade papers and correct papers into the wee hours of the morning and just sort of the dedication that it requires. And when we added sort of the virtual learning and all the challenges of this pandemic, um, that job got incredibly difficult, uh, incredibly fast, and our teachers responded. Uh, and so I just want to thank them for that. Uh, I know that BPS, uh, as a former BPS student myself, uh, often gets a bad rap in how they are discussed or talked about, but I know that in each and every single individual school, we have educators and teachers and uh, nurses and social workers and guidance counselors who are doing their very best to educate and prepare our children uh, and are sometimes facing surmountable odds, when, uh, insurmountable odds when we talk about the uh, requirements that we are placing upon them and or the lack of resources and funding that we are giving them to reach and, and meet these goals uh, and frankly, the lack of supports they receive when we are talking about things like housing or outside of the classroom problems that impact inside the classroom. Uh, and so I am very heartened by the fact that this budget uh, maintains the uh, progress we made last year with a school nurse in every school. Uh, I am grateful that it adds one social worker at minimum per school full time. I think that's uh, one of the places I would like to see our budget continue to go which is addressing the mental health of our students. And so in that sense, I'm grateful that this adds 26 school psychologists. I would like to get us to a place where we have one per school as well, uh, because we already had issues with making sure that our kids were receiving the social and emotional supports that they need at school. The pandemic only is going to continue to sort of make that uh, a much more dire and pressing need. Uh, and I think we are seeing sort of the impact of that on educators and on students. And so. I'm grateful that this budget adds 26 school psychologists. I'm grateful it adds one full-time social worker per school. And I hope that as we continue to work on these things that we continue to take into account not just their performance academically, but their actual social and mental health and well-being, which includes also athletics, uh, as Councilor Murphy has brought up, and making sure that we are teaching and, and reaching the whole child. Uh, I'm grateful to the strides that this budget makes towards creating uh, curriculum and materials that are uh, inclusive and diverse in who and what kids are learning and seeing uh, and that they are seeing themselves reflected in both what is available to them in their library but also in their curriculum. Uh, and so I will be voting yes on this. There are places where I think we can do better. Uh, I would hope and am and, and still pushing for ARPA funding to go towards infrastructure changes so that we can actually address some of the real infrastructure problems that we have within our schools uh, that we've had for decades uh, and frankly are long overdue. Uh, and that we continue to build upon uh, things that we have not done well and we continue to sort of ensure that we are giving funding to those issues uh, and addressing those issues with staffing and making sure that we get to a place where our teachers are reflective of our populations. But this budget, as it's currently written, does address one of my major issues, which is social and emotional health uh, for our students. And so in that way, I am grateful and in that way I support this budget. I will be voting yes. Thank you, Council President Flynn. Thank you, Council Royal. The Chair recognizes Council Lujan. Um, Council Lujan, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. And, um, and I want to thank <laughs> Councilor Fernandez Anderson for all the work you've done in really getting us here. Uh, a lot of it was late nights and uh, by yourself and, and doing a lot of work with Michelle, so thank you so much on that. Um, you know, as many people who are here, I am also a BPS graduate. Um, and. BPS is our biggest expense, as it should be, um, as if we maintain public education as a public good and we need to support it with our resources. So um, I'm encouraged by this budget. I'm encouraged especially by the $2 billion commitment to a Green New Deal for our schools. Our school buildings need to reflect the dignity and affirm the dignity that we have for each and every one, uh, that each and every one of our students has. Um, and so I'm encouraged by that. One of the things that was really, that struck me at the 
uh, hearing on state receivership that I spoke in opposition to and so many others spoke in opposition to. There was a guidance counselor of the year was present and a lot of the members asked her, what can we do to better support our students? And she said, we can have more guidance counselors, more and more and more guidance counselors, even more than meeting what the state minimums are and what the national standards are. Our students are facing an unprecedented, uh, unprecedented mental health crisis. When we talk about what's been happening, um, not only with the pandemic, but you know the racial reckoning um, and issues going unaddressed. And so I think that we have a lot more work to do when it comes to providing uh, more guidance counselors for our students. Um, when it comes to supporting our English language learners, our students with uh, 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 interrupted learning in our SLIFE program um, who have faced uh, a number of challenges but are still trying to either learn English or uh, maintain uh, going to school despite life challenges. We need to support our principals and uh, support greater teacher diversity to reflect what the classrooms look like because we know that there's incredible value in that. I talk about these issues because they're also the issues that were important to me. My guidance counselor really helped me navigate processes that I wasn't familiar with and that my family wasn't familiar with. And we know that guidance counselors can really change lives. So um, I hope um, that, in, uh, that the work that our new superintendent does and the work that a lot of folks have been talking about that we continue to support our students um, as they navigate issues both in school and out of school. Um, and also, I mean, this is something that I said a lot, there are a lot of good things happening at BPS. Um, and BPS just needs to do a better job of communicating what's working, like the availability of more K0, of K0 and K1 seats that parents don't know about, um, students graduating with associate's degrees, including from Madison Park. So a lot of the uh, our ability to attract students from charter schools, although we need to be able to track that data better. So there's a lot of things that are working in that. We just need to do a better job of communicating that. So I'm going to support the chair here and her recommendation to pass um, the BPS budget with the understanding that our role here as city councilors is to hold uh, BPS accountable to really make sure that BPS central office um, is, is doing the work to make sure our buses are arriving on time, to make sure that our students are getting the resources that they need, um, that, we are, that when we see graduates crossing the stage as I was seeing yesterday, that we can look into their eyes and say that we've done everything we can to prepare you and set you up for a good life. I'm not sure we can do that 100% now, but our role is to make sure that, that happens. So thank you and, and thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for all of your work. Thank you, Council Ojan. The Chair recognizes Council of Flaherty. Council of Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, thanks to the respective Chair, obviously Chair of Ways and Means and Chair of Education. Uh, for me, uh, as it stands right now, I'm, I'm a no. Uh, we have children who do not feel safe in school. We have children who are not uh, arriving to school on time, and some not arriving at all. We, have, we don't have a bona fide uh, vocational tech school. I'm talking best in the country. Not enough of our kids are getting into some of the greatest schools in the world that call Boston their home. We boast of the best colleges and universities in the world. Not enough of our kids are getting into those schools. And the ones that do and are fortunate to get in, most of them are home at the Thanksgiving break not to return because of the curriculum. And so as it stands, uh, let's forget about facilities and we're talking about obviously uh, lack of sporting programs and lack of attention to uh, to uh, school psychologists and things like that. So yeah, we're, we're continuing to make strides. Uh, and you know, uh, I've never not supported our Boston Public Schools and our Boston Public School students. Uh, but the time has come where this legislative branch uh, has to say, we have seen and heard enough. And whether it's the bullying that takes place in the schools or whether it's the violence that's taking place in the schools or whether we continue to hear story after story after story of late arrivals or children actually being left on the street, at the curb, not getting picked up at all. Enough is enough, and I think our leverage is right now. We have an opportunity to send the message back to Boston Public Schools that we, uh, you know, we're, we're obviously tired of, uh, of the spin. We're tired of uh, ducking and dodging. We're tired of no accountability. Uh, and that our leverage now is that we send it back, that we're not prepared to pass this right now. They need to do better. They need to make assurances to this body to the student body and to their families that their schools will be safe, that their children will get to school on time, and that with respect to teaching and learning, uh, and uh, in addition to the uh, extra efforts that need to be made, obviously, for our English language learners and students with disabilities who are completely being left behind, all of that, sum and substance, says, hey, we're, we shouldn't just pass this right now. We ought to send a message back to them that they need to do better, that we're going to hold them accountable. 
And this isn't about our teachers who do great work. Our colleague uh, spent a tremendous amount of time on the front lines, taught my children. Uh, there are some good news stories happening in our Boston public schools. We don't hear enough of them. And it's in the classroom with teaching and learning. So my issue with this budget is not with our teachers and not with the teaching and learning. It's with BPS Central. It's bloated. It's a morass. They don't listen. They're not responsive. And they're not accountable, no matter what superintendent comes in. And as a result of which, we're seeing the results of decades of neglect. So for me, I, I, I'm a no. I'm encouraging my colleagues to be a no. Let's send a message back to them that we're not there yet. They need to sharpen the pencil. They need to come back to us with all the things that we've just discussed. Our colleagues through you, Mr. Chair, have raised some very important critical issues. And my suggestion through you to them is if, if what you've raised is not in this budget, then we need to say no right now. And let's see if we can get them in the budget over the next three weeks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Flaherty. Um, the Chair recognizes Council Baker, then I'll recognize um, Council Bach after. Council Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I don't want to delay, uh, delay about a lot of this here. We've talked about it. Safety, transportation, vocational, vocational education, um, certain curriculums. I believe that the, we're not um, giving our children the best, what we should give them. We, this has been an issue 50 plus years, and we think something's going to change. A vote here, a, a yes vote here today is a vote for status quo because we think you're doing good enough. I don't think we're doing good enough. Um, I will be voting no today um, to, to echo a Councilor Orwell, Orwell who, was, who was eloquent in in the way he spoke about what are they doing after school? What is the value of a BPS education? I'd be, I'd be very interested to see what that is. Multiple people have talked about grave concerns. The way we will speak to grave concerns if, if it's a no and we send it back and it becomes a 112th budget and they're coming in front of us every month to talk to us about what they're doing. I don't feel that this was a, 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 um, a and also thank, I wanted to, from the beginning, I should have thanked Councilor Anderson for her work and all this, Yeoman's work. Um, but yes, I think there's a, there's a saying in AA, if nothing changes, nothing changes. This vote is to throw more money at it, but we're not getting at the root at it. We're not changing some things we need to change. Transportation, school safety, vocation, what we're doing around inclusion. The one inclusion school that I had in my, in, in my I think Council Rell and I share the, share the area, um, has been decimated. They were a national model. They're not anymore. And that was because of decisions made from on high that they implemented in a school that was, that was doing very well. We can't say that there today with straight face. So I will be a no here today. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Baker. The chair recognizes Council Bach. Council Bach, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and I, I also want to thank Councillor uh, Fernandez Anderson. And uh, I, I know firsthand uh, how much work this all is. And um, I want to offer more thanks at some of the other dockets. Um, but definitely on BPS, uh, it's about a third of the hearings and, um, and really quite a lot of information uh, to process for the council so we can be here today. Um, I, I think what I want to say is, is very much to agree with colleagues about many of the great challenges that we face at BPS, um, but to disagree with Councillors Baker and um, Flaherty about sort of what the logical move at this juncture is. I think we recognize that the Boston Public Schools face tremendous challenges. I was here a year ago saying that obviously enrollment declines seems like in certain ways the biggest one, if only because it drives the challenges for everything else in terms of giving our students these quality schools. and. Um, and attracting everyone to the system. Um, and then, as I've mentioned before, the early literacy um, rates continue to concern me deeply, although I think the, um, the administration has, in the inter intervening year, been quite aggressive about rolling out new standards across. And so on the academics front, I'm encouraged both by that and by the commitment to Mass Corps. Um, but we have, we have huge challenges, and, and we all know that the, you know, the building commitment is great, but gosh, is it needed. And, um, and you know the thought about okay, we want to have a quality schools commitment is great, but how are we going to get there? I just think that when you know when you're in a storm, and then you're about to appoint the sort of captain of the new ship, it's not the time to also kind of court martial them. And my sense is that you know 
but this is really a moment where we need deep partnership in the city. And that means that we need the council to be in partnership with the new mayor and the imminently very new superintendent um, to, really, uh, to really steer the ship of BPS in a better direction. Um, and I, I can't see starting that out instead of being from a, a place of partnership, sort of being show up your first day and be before us on your budget. I mean, to me, there's already enough swords hanging over this system when we talk about sort of the state uh, apparatus recently and, and it just feels to me like we're reaching out to all of our partners we want our you know we want our private partners our universities all our community partners to really like come in and all wrap our arms around bps and and make it um the best system it can possibly be and a system of choice that attracts people um and and get those enrollment numbers back up and it's hard for me to imagine that we would start that virtuous cycle um, by, sig by signaling you know, an unwillingness to pass BPS's budget. So I guess the way I feel is that although these challenges are before us, they're challenges that we have to take collectively and that the step that the council can take in good faith today for an incoming superintendent facing a lot of uncertainty and headwinds um, is to give them the, si the certainty of a past budget. So I'll be voting in the affirmative. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Bork. Anyone else like to speak on this? Council Fernandez Anderson, the chair on the Committee of Ways and Means, seeks acceptance of the committee report in passage of docket 0481. Mr. Clerk, can you please take the roll call? Roll call on docket 0481. Council Arroyo? Yes. Council Arroyo, yes. Council Baker? Nay. Council Baker, nay. Council Bach? Yes. Council Bach, yes. Council Braden? Yes. Council Braden, yes. Council Coletta? Councilor Coletta, yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, yes. Councilor Flaherty. No. Councilor Flaherty, no. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Lara. Councilor Lara, yes. Councilor Louis Jen. Yes. Councilor Louis Jen, yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor Murphy. No. Councilor Murphy, no. And Councilor Worrell. Yes. Councilor Worrell, yes. Docket 0481 has received a majority of the firm. Thank you, Mr. Clark. I'm so, uh, the chair recognizes Council Fernandez Anderson. Council Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Is it okay if we take a five minute break? I have to tinkle. This, this body will be in recess for five minutes. Thanks. We're back in session. <laughs> Council Fernandez Anderson um, will speak on docket 0482 is the, is the next matter we'll take up. Um, the chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Docket 0482 represents the operating budget allocation to funds, excuse me, to fund the city's liability for other post-employment benefits, OPEB. While the city is required by law to make an annual contribution toward reducing its unfunded pension liability, there is no such requirement for retiree health and life insurance benefits. In FY08, the city was required to follow new governmental accounting standards board GASP, GASB requir requirements to identify and disclose this estimated liability. At the same time, 
The city also voluntarily began to annually allocate funds to reduce to OPEB liability. Annual allocations are retained in an irrevocable trust fund authorized through the city's acceptance of Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 32B Section 20 as added by Chapter 479 of the Acts of 2008. The city has been contributing $40 million to this fund each year since FY13. And so as Chair of Ways and Means, I recommend that this docket ought to pass. Thank you, Council fernandez Innocent. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Council fernandez Innocent, the Chair of the Committee on Ways and Means, seeks acceptance of the committee report passes, passage of docket 0482. Mr. Clerk, can we do a roll call vote, please? Roll call on docket number 0482, Council Arroyo. Yes. Council Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Aye. Councilor Baker, aye. Councilor Bach. Councilor Bach, aye. Councilor Braden. Aye. Councilor Braden, aye. Councilor Coletta. Collette, yes. Sorry. Yes. yes. Councilor Coletta, yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Lara. Yes. Councilor Lara, yes. Councilor Louise Yen. Yes. Councilor Louise Yen, yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Murphy, yes. And Councilor Worrell. Yes. Councilor Worrell, docket number 0482 has received a unanimous vote. The docket has passed. Mr. Um, <coughs> Council Fernandez Anderson um, will speak now on docket 0483. Uh, the chair recognizes Council Fernandez Anderson. Thank you again, Mr. President. Um, now moving to docket 0483. Um, docket 0483 involves an appropriation of $1,600,000 from the city's capital grant fund to address the impact of transportation network services on municipal roads, bridges, and other transportation infrastructure, or to be used for any other public purpose sustainability related to the operations of transportation network companies, TNCs, in the city. Under Chapter 187 of the Acts of 2016, certain transportation network companies must submit to the Department of Public Utilities, DPU, the number of rides from the previous calendar year that originated within each city of, or town and per ride assessment, which are credited to the Commonwealth Transportation Infrastructure Fund, and then half of the fee is distributed by the Department of Public Utilities, DPU, proportionately to each city and town based on the number of rides that originated in the city or town. The funds are collected and deposited to the city as special revenue and must be included in <clears throat> and must be appropriated to be spent. These funds are earmarked for TNC-related purposes, including investments into, way, into, into ways of mitigating the impact of TNCs and alternate modes of transportation. And so, as Chair on Ways and Means, I recommend that this docket ought to pass. Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. Um, Mr. Clark, can you please call the roll? Roll call on docket number 0483, Council Arroyo. Yes. Council Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Councilor Baker, aye. Councilor Bach. Aye. Councilor Bach, aye. Councilor Braden. Aye. Councilor Braden, aye. Councilor Coletta. Yes. Councilor Coletta, yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Lara. Yes. Councilor Lara, yes. Councilor Louis Yes. Councilor Louis Yen, yes. Councilor Mejia. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor Murphy. Councilor Murphy, yes, and Councilor Worrell. Yes. Councilor Worrell, yes. Docket number 0483 has received a unanimous vote. The docket has passed. Uh, the chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson on docket 0484. Thank you. Uh, now moving on to docket 0484 to 0486 Capital. 
We come together as a collective today to put forth a budget that will work for the masses of the residents and citizens of our city. And it isn't just for the matter of total amount of money that will be spent. Rather, it's who the money will be spent on and who gets to decide how the money will be spent. That we acknowledge today. We speak often of equity, but we don't practice it nearly as often. And when it comes to the proposed capital budget, I see much, of, much to approve of. But I can't help but to note that the plethora of projects that are being proposed are in predominantly affluent communities. It has been said that in the capitalist country, when there is a struggle between a rich person and a poor person, the rich person usually emerges victoriously. I humbly propose to you that we should put our shoulder to the wheel in an effort to reverse this to the best of our ability. So for those who do not have access to power, for those who aren't listened to when they speak, and for those who are food insecure, rent burden, burdened, homeless, suffering from addiction, victims of untreated mental illness. Simply put, for the masses of black, brown, immigrant, and working class communities throughout our city, we must say to them clearly and unequivocally that we are with them and that this budget will begin a process by which they can thrive and not merely survive. The resources are there. Of that, there is no doubt. And we support that these significant funds be utilized via the capital budget. But we must ensure that our support is rooted in guaranteeing that our communities most in need of resources and services get what they need. This is essential both as repair for histories of racism and class inequality <clears throat> and for the ongoing manifestations of inequity that are prevalent across a spectrum of socioeconomic concerns. And so, with all of that being said, I will recommend that, uh, as Chair Ways and Means, I recommend that these dockets be read for the first time and assigned for further, um, action. further action. Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. Um, Mr. Clerk, uh, well, before we do that, would anyone else like to speak on this matter? The, the chair recognizes Council Worrell. Council Worrell, you have the floor. Thank you, um, President Flynn. And um, I'd like to thank the administration for working in collaboration with our office uh, to bring in expanding capital investments in District 4. Um, and when I walk the streets of my district, um, a constant theme I hear in the blackest and brownest neighborhoods in Boston is, it's kind of sad to hear it is, that nothing, nothing changes and government doesn't work. Uh, the truth in their statements is visible when you walk our main streets and neighborhoods and see the legacy of generations of underinvestments, vacant lots, unused buildings, broken sidewalks, unrepaired schools and playgrounds disproportionately line my district. Uh, last September, many of our student residents went to the polls hopeful that after two years of protests against systemic racism in a historic mayoral field, they will finally be served in a way that understands the urgency of the moment. We all were sworn in knowing that business as usual was not working for too many people. The word equity we use often came to the forefront, and in that time we all understood going back to systems and practices that have historically contributed to disinvestments of black and brown neighborhoods was clearly out of the question. If not now, then when? And what other moment is needed? In the last five years, District 4 has received the least in the capital plan by dollar amount and percentage of any neighborhood. It is, not, it is the only neighborhood whose capital budget has not surpassed $200 million during that time frame, while other districts have surpassed over $1 billion. We need corrective, equitable investments that are constructed with urgency. I want to I thank Mayor Wu that in this capital plan, 
We are inching towards making those investments and righting past wrongs. With line items like a study for Town Field, improvements to streets and upgrades to Benka, along with commitment for future investments, our communities who have historically not seen infrastructure investments will now see more. The state of our environment, the, the state of your environment affects your behavior and health. As a city, the role we play in eradicating the ongoing issues facing black and brown communities and directly, is, is directly correlated with the investments that are made in the capital plan. New and increased invest, investments will not only be perceived as transformative leadership, but will heal past trauma and restore faith that local government can and will work in our underserved communities. I'm looking forward to the urgency around current and future, future equitable investments to correct the wrongs of years of disinvestments in black and brown neighborhoods and making our capital plan more equitable. Thank you. Thank you, Council Worrell. The chair recognizes Councilor Bach. Council Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Um, and I also rise to support the capital plan, but to say that you know, I think um, I'm, I'm glad to hear about studies and such that have been added to achieve greater equity. I think as we've often seen in the capital budget, um, a small study in the first year can turn into a major expenditure, and I hope that as some of the things that Councilor Worrell just referenced that um, I sort of bloom, that that really adjusts some of these totals that he was just talking about. And I also just want to say that I am um, just as hopeful and also impatient that by the time we're here again in a year, we will really be seeing the, uh, the progress from the administration adding these positions in PFD that, they, that are promised in this budget because I think as folks have heard me say before, one of my frustrations is not only that there's the question of you know, what, what is the equity and frankly just the level of commitment that we're rising to in the actual capital budget, but then it's like how quickly is that commitment actually realized? And you know, so many of us see projects that just kind of have languished year after year and so um, I'm really hopeful. I know there's a, a significant number of us on the council. I, I know Councillor, uh, the Madam Chair, uh, Councillor Fernandez Anderson shares this view, Councillor Louis Jen, but that we could be just doing more in the capital budget. Um, and the reality is even under our 7% limit, we're only hitting an effective like 5.3 because we're just not getting these projects out the door. So I just, I wanna emphasize that um, I'm excited about a number of things in this capital budget, but particularly excited about the idea that we could just be building more infrastructure more quickly for the residents of Boston, because I really don't think there's a better bet investment-wise than public infrastructure in this country. Um, often, you know, we, we talk about it like it's 30-year stuff, but we tend to build 100-year stuff. Um, and it just has such a huge impact on the kind of public goods of the city that um, all of our residents get to enjoy. Um, and I just wanted to flag, I meant to say this under BPS, but it's more appropriate here, um, that for me, one of my focuses in the next six months is gonna be as we talk about this BPS $2 billion capital plan, how do we really make sure that that specifically is being pursued with the urgency that doesn't sort of put us in the traditional capital timeline, but actually like really make sure that those new schools are gonna be delivered for our students on an expedited schedule, because um, I think that will make all the difference for it really fulfilling its promise. So with all that said, proud to support the capital budget today. Thank you, Council Block. The chair rec recognizes Council Louis Jen. Council Louis Jen, you have the floor. Mr. President, I won't belabor the moment. I just wanted to thank uh, the chair of Ways and Means, Councilor Fernand Anderson, and Council Worrell for all their work. Um, you know that we've done really in, in uplifting how inequitable um, we can sometimes be when we're planning for our future, when we're planning, when we're looking at the capital budget. So I just, um, when we're looking at our poorest districts, when we're looking at our districts that have the highest concentration of Black and Brown folks. And when we're thinking about equity being the corrective action that we need to take, we really need to be leaning in and making sure that's, that our capital budget really reflects that. Uh, Council Bach brought up, you know, we are, we are a very wealthy city. We have a lot of money and it's just that wealth is not shared. That prosperity that we experience as a city that is often built on the blacks, backs of working class folks, on black and brown folks, that is not shared. And I think our capital budget is a way for us to really think about how we're using our fiscal strength, to think about how we're bonding and how we're using our AAA bond rating to really invest in the public infrastructure in the way that um, Councillor Brock was talking about. So just wanna thank you, Madam Chair, for the work that you've done here. Councillor Orell, uh, you know, the, the data and the research you've done to show how much we've disinvested in neighborhoods like D4, and hopefully uh, we can get it right um, continuing in the future. So thank you. Thank you, Council Lewis. And uh, the chair recognizes Council Murphy. Council Murphy, thank you have the you. floor. And thank you, Chair. 
and Vice Chair for all your work. Um, so I definitely have high hopes for this $3.6 billion capital plan, and I want to thank Mayor Wu and the administration for this. It includes improvements to our schools, open spaces, community centers, streets, and bridges. Although I'm in, I am in support of the project, I want to highlight a few that I'm especially excited about. The improvements to our community centers, especially the Curley, Matterhunt, and North End centers, and the Paris Street Pool. Improvements to the East Boston Police Station, the preservation of the Long Island facility in Woods Mullins Shelter, and the resiliency improvements in the Harbor Walk and open space construction, which I know will make our oceanfront more equitable and accessible to all. And the improvements to the Boston Public Schools facilities, especially when I see athletic facility upgrades, I'm very excited. So the amount of mon this amount of money has the ability to transform our city and jumpstart projects that have been overshadowed in the past. And I do want to thank you, Council Worrell, for bringing that to us um, to light with your data of D4. And as an at-large city councilor, I'm here to support and advocate your efforts in that district. So I will be voting in support of the capital budget. Thank you. Thank you, Council Murphy. The chair recon recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the, this is a new day, right? The way we normally do business is we either, uh, when it comes to the capital budget and BPS, we usually have a tradition to just, you know, vote without prejudice. And so I wasn't prepared to speak on the capital budget, but now I've been inspired to do so. Um, so just really quick, uh, again, want to thank the chair and the vice chair, and actually all of my colleagues who have been uplifting the importance of recognizing that we have a responsibility. As a citywide counselor, you know, I, I spend a lot of time across the city and I see who has and who has not. And I think um, as we continue to move through these processes, I think it's really important from a process standpoint is that when it comes to the capital budget, I don't see a lot of conversations that are happening in deep community about what it is that they need. And I think that that's an opportunity where we have to be able to lean in to create more opportunities for those who are living um, in in, in different neighborhoods to speak for themselves around the things that, that they want to see. Oftentimes, a lot of these conversations around the budget usually just falls on the operating budget, which I appreciate and I understand there's a lot at risk. Um, but at the same time, I think capital should be another um, space where we start leaning in a little bit more if we're really serious about building equity here in the city of Boston. And more importantly, creating space for those um, who actually pay for our salaries uh, to be informing how we spend their capital dollars. So with that, I just wanted to uplift the importance of voice and look forward to moving the conversation along. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. The chair recognizes Council Braden. Council Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'm excited to see this uh, broad ranging capital budget. Uh, one, two concerns I want to flag up. One is, you know, in terms of uh, we appropriate funds for pro capital projects, but but in the in the past, I, I, I echo my colleague Councillor Box concern about sometimes the glacial pace of progress, but very often that boils down to uh, the the need to have uh, project managers in place and uh, all the folks that manage a project and and shepherd it through the process. And we have a, a human resources challenge here, and I hope that we can address that aggressively in the next year to m make sure that we have the infrastructure in place to help shepherd these projects to their completion. Um, as a district councillor for Alston Brighton, District 9, um, I applaud the uh, inclusion of a study for a new elementary school in Alston and the uh, a new school, the Horace Mann uh, Regional School for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. Uh, one of my biggest concerns is the urgency of addressing the imminent closure of the BCYF um, community centre at the Jackson Man Complex in Union Square. It is the only uh, community centre, BCYF community centre we have in our neighbourhood. Uh, we're the second largest neighbourhood in the city with a population of over 75,000. And this is our only community centre. It is, a, it is an emergency, FEMA emergency centre, a heating and cooling centre. It is the polling place for five precincts. It is, it is adult education, early education and childcare. It is an absolutely essential piece of our community inter infrastructure. We cannot afford to have it shuttered and closed and have nothing in its place for 
for the time that it will take to build a new centre. So I am appealing for urgency and I will be continuing to advocate strongly to have this, this project expedited in the, in the near future. So I will be voting in support of this capital budget but I also want to hold up these concerns with regard to Alston Brighton. Thank you, Council Brighton. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? <clears throat> Mr. Cora, can you please Call the roll. Roll call on docket 0484. Councillor Arroyo? Yes. Councillor Arroyo, yes. Councillor Baker? Aye. Councillor Baker, aye. Councillor Bach? Aye. Councillor Bach, aye. Councillor Braden? Aye. Councillor Braden, aye. Councillor Coletta? Yes. Councillor Coletta, yes. Councillor Fernandez Anderson? Yes. Councillor Fernandez Anderson, yes. Councillor Flaherty? Yes. Councillor Flaherty, yes. Councillor Flynn? Yes. Councillor Flynn, yes. Councillor Lara? Councilor Lara, yes. Councilor Louis Jen. Yes. Councilor Louis Jen, yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Murphy, yes. And Councilor Worrell. Yes. Councilor Worrell, yes. Docket number 0484 is received a unanimous vote. The docket has received its first reading and will be assigned for further action. The chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson on docket 0485. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Typically, I like to talk and I have jokes, but today I didn't want to talk so much. Moving on. Now returning to docket 0480, Departmental Operations. No. The, the chair recognized. What? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Um, yeah, the chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson, docket 0485. Yeah, I've already spoken on all of them. She thinks she spoke. Say it again. The, we'll take a brief recess. Back in session, we're continuing 0485. Roll call vote on docket 0485. Councilor Arroyo? Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker? Aye. Councilor Baker, aye. Councilor Bach? Aye. Councilor Bach, aye. Councilor Braden? Aye. Councilor Braden, aye. Councilor Coletta? Yes. Councilor Coletta, yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson? Yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, yes. Councilor Flaherty? Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor <laughs> Flynn? Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Lara? Council Lara, yes. Council Louis Jen. Yes. Council Louis Jen, yes. Council Mejia. Yes. Council Mejia, yes. Council Murphy. Yes. Council Murphy, yes. And Council Worrell. Yes. Council Worrell, yes. Docket number 0485 has received a unanimous vote. The docket has received its first reading and will be assigned for further action. Um, Mr. Quirk, would you do a roll call vote on docket 0486? Roll call on docket 0486, Councilor Arroyo? Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker? Aye. Councilor Baker, aye. Councilor Bach? Aye. Councilor Bach, aye. Councilor Braden? Aye. Councilor Braden, aye. Councilor Coletta? Yes. Councilor Coletta, yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson? Yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, yes. Councilor Flaherty? Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn? Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Lara? Yes. Councilor Lara, yes. Councilor Louis Jen? Councilor Louis Jen, yes. Councilor Mejia? Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Murphy, yes. And Councilor Worrell? Yes. Councilor Worrell, yes. Docket number 0486 has received a unanimous vote. The docket has received its first reading. will be assigned for further action. We will go back to docket 0480, which is the operating budget as amended by the council pursuant to our new authority under the charter amendment. Uh, the Chair recognizes Council Fernandez Innocent. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. And now the moment we've all been waiting for. Uh, now returning to docket 0480, do Departmental Operations. 
Finally, I want to take this time to uh, first thank um, our dear clerk, Alex, and team. I uh, appreciate all the work that you do. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank my incredible colleagues who this could not have been possible without. Councillor Mejia, I thank you for standing firmly, feet planted, as you speak your truth with an epic strength and passion. Councillor Murphy, I applaud you for your fundamental decency, your career in education, and for your ongoing concern and advocacy for our city. Councillor President Flynn, I deeply appreciate your kindness and consistency in the face of up and downs in seemingly second nature to this work. Councillor Worrell, I warmly acknowledge your quiet, quiet strength and steadfastness and your willingness to collaborate. Councillor Lada, I salute you for, your, for being an ex eternal soldier on behalf of the, the dis disenfranchised and marginalized and for bringing your fighting spirit into this chamber each and every day. Councillor Braden, I greatly appreciate your thoughtful, intuitive, and quietly strong demeanor. There have been times <laughs> in this chamber when I may not have heard or seen you, but I felt your presence. Councillor Bach, I am incredib incredibly grateful for your intelligence and for the hard work you put in, your ability to selfishly do the work of five people is nothing short of mind-boggling. Councillor Baker, you're my guy. <laughs> I love your big heart and powerful passion. In truth, because of those traits, I would rather disagree with you than agree with most of the people I've known. Councillor Louis Jen. You have become my sister. You combine equal parts, brilliance, and boldness. And getting to know you has been a highlight of this journey for me. I care for you deeply while learning to love you. Council of Flaherty, I so appreciate your acts of kindness to me personally, and for your great professionalism, class, and class that you demonstrate daily. Councillor Arroyo, I wouldn't have this experience without you, and you know what I mean. This would, was not possible without you. I am grateful for your skill and your will, your passion for justice, and your quiet but firm leadership that you exercise so eloquently. And finally, Councillor Coletta, so gentle. I salute you for jumping in right into this process with the confidence, knowledge, and presence of a 10-year-old veteran. And it has been a marvel to behold. I am happy to have all of you as my colleagues and I am happy to say that we have put forth a budget that can begin, need I say that again, begin to function toward a betterment of all Bostonians. On this day, I state with confidence our proposed policies have begun to match our jargon and our actions have inched closer to our words. Let us continue on this path together till we collectively craft and create the conditions that will assist in producing a city that we can all be proud of. Pursuant of the 2021 Charter Amendment, 
The City Council has worked this budget season to put forward an amendment draft rather than our typical rejection on the second Wednesday in June. The committee conducted a robust process to review the mayor's proposal beginning in April and running through, June, through this week. This process has included 30 public hearings on departmental budgets and associated capital projects, including two sessions dedicated to public participation and has received written testimony from all city departments, as well as written recorded testimony from the public. The committee also held four working sessions for council deliberation to put forward amendments to the mayor's proposal. The council proposed amendments to docket 0480 fall in two categories, intra-departmental and inter-departmental. For inter, I'm sorry, for intra-departmental amendments include additional environmental health inspectors for pest control, further road and abatement materials, including traps, baiting, and dry ice, additional funding for senior home repair program, two additional part-time cross guards for the Winship and Baldwin schools, funding to contract a tour bus company for the Ottery in District 7, tourism contracts dedicated to African culture events such as festivals and parades, additional addition of an EMS supervisor in the community initiatives, divi initiatives division, mental health response crisis training to be provided to the city council and 311 staff, additional youth and senior programming at the Nazaro Community Center, grant opportunities along the artery in District 7, two additional parking enforcement officers in East Boston, a pilot homeownership voucher program for the BHA, funding for historic preservation of an African American Arts Museum in Roxbury, maintenance of the grant to the SMART from the start program, funding for acquisition of land to preserve natural wilds, funding for a college youth academic partnership program that will pay students for participating in tutoring, funding for experiential learning opportunities for youth, funding to expedite pedestrian safety measures, funding to build capacity and linguistically appropriate technical assistance for immigrant businesses, grant opportunities for immigrant owned small businesses, a Jackson Man transition coordinator position, Jackson Man transition resources, addition of an early literacy specialist position, a pilot for housing stipends for young people aged 19 to 29, 24, my apologies, housing stipends for municipal employees struggling to pay rent or own a, a home payments. Now moving on to in, in, intra, so intra-departmental amendments totaling $8,832,000 or 0.53% of the budget of the appropriation order. Now moving on to interdepartmental amendments. The addition of 15 Hokies, two for Alston Brighton, for one, one for Chinatown, two for East Boston, two for District 4, two for Roxbury, two for Fenway, Mission Hill, Beacon Hill, two for District 2, and two citywide. District 3, my apologies. The addition of a director of waterfront planning position. Funding for BHA for the city housing voucher program with set asides for project base, basing at IDP units to buy deeper affordability, returning citizens, and BHA home ownership pilot launch. Funding to accelerate waste reduction programs with addition staff positions. Funding to provide a subsidy for expanded Mission Hill link service. Additional staff for treat maintenance, an increase to the annual allocation to the Boston Groundwater Trust to $200,000. Full funding for 6,000 youths, 
jobs and 1,500 year-round jobs, additional personnel for general support in the city clerk's office, increased capacity for black male advancement, funding for ESOL courses, increased capacity in the Office of Returning Citizens, small grant opportunities for graffiti busters, increase to city council personnel services to right size staff wages and add central positions to support the council with its new budgetary authority, funding for LGBTQ events, additional funding to support immigrants lead Boston, personnel funding to bolster already budgeted for upgrades to the legacy 311 system to reform Boston 311, funding to provide technical assistance for all 20 Main Street districts, funding, I'm sorry, additional staff for SOAR Charlestown, funding for burial assistance, funding for senior programming at the Veronica Smith Center in Brighton, commissioning of a citywide life insurance study, funding for BFD CAR 5, uh, Boston Fire Department, CAR 5, funding for the clerk's office to pro <clears throat> procure codification services for the review and uh, sorry, recodification of the city of Boston code ordinances and special acts relating to the city of Boston, including the city charter, youth workers to support programming for youth residents of BHA Commonwealth Apartments and B Boston Public, House, uh, Authority, Public Housing Authority Faneuil Gardens, programmatic support for Citizenship Day, salary increases for employees at Boston Youth Development Network. Interdepartmental amendments total 17 dollars $6,618 in fund transfers across various departments, which represents just over 1% of the docket appropriation order. The amended draft being proposed is net neutral, pursuant of our responsibilities under the Charter and reflects the Council's priorities for FY23 in working toward a better, safer, more equitable city that takes care of its residents and employees. And so, as chair of Ways and Means, I recommend that this docket ought to pass in amended draft. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? The chair recognizes Council Alara. Council Alara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn, and thank you to Councillor um, Fernandez Anderson for stewarding us through this very long and tedious process in the budget. I rise today um, to show my support for this amended budget. I think that um, the budget that was presented to us by Mayor Wu did an amazing job at what she calls um, getting the small things right so that we can do the big things. And this budget that has been presented by the City Council in its amended version goes one step further, not only to reaffirm the mayor's vision of doing the small things right, but to do it in a way that is collaborative and that includes not only our personal vision for the big things that the City of Boston needs, but the very specific needs that our constituents has, have asked us to represent here on the City Council. I think that this amended version of this budget is a beautiful amalgamation of both the mayor's vision and the needs of all of our districts, and I'm excited to send it to the mayor for um, her approval. I want to rise today to speak specifically about the amendment that I included here um, in the um, committee report. The amendment for uh, just under $7 million for youth jobs um, in the city of Boston is representative of the largest line item amendment made to the city of Boston budget. And it's something that's very near and dear to my heart because I got my start uh, organizing here in the city of Boston, asking for the city of Boston to increase the city's youth job budget. At that time, I was 15 years old. I am almost 33 now, and so it's been a long fight um, of almost, if not already, two decades of the young people of the city of Boston asking for the city council and the mayor to ensure that the resources that were um, set aside for the young people in the city of Boston were up to par with the needs. That we would be investing in young people, investing in their well-being, and investing in the safety and the well-being of our communities as well. 
But today, I don't just want to talk about myself. I want to um, talk about Ival Brown. Ival Brown was a 17-year-old young man from Mattapan who, at a very young age, as a juvenile, um, spent his time with the wrong crowd and became um, gang involved very early. At the age of 15, Ival came across a youth worker who offered him a youth job during the summer. And that was the catalyst for Ival's transformation. Ival would spend the next three years becoming <laughs> what I consider one of the most prolific youth organizers that the city of Boston has ever seen. And Ival's fight of choice was the youth jobs fight. Year after year, Ival came and testified before the city council to ask that the Boston City Council increase the budget for the youth jobs. Sometimes we won, sometimes we lost, sometimes we made concessions, but never did the mayor or the city council meet the request that the young people in the city of Boston were making. I got the incredible pleasure of being Ival's youth worker at 31 Heath Street, at the Youth Aim Boston at Family Service of Greater Boston. I got to watch Ival blossom into an incredible young man who committed all of his time, not only into maintaining his own youth job, but into ensuring that all of the young people in his neighborhood who were currently or previously gang involved had an opportunity to get out. On Memorial Day, as Ival was sitting on his front steps waiting for his mother to bring him to one of our actions, Ival was stabbed and killed. Now, I know that to a lot of people this may sound like maybe it's not a success story because Ival didn't make it. But my advocacy for these $6.9 million comes from a place of considering the shooting that didn't happen and the young person that didn't have to lose their life like Ival because they weren't at the wrong place at the wrong time. The young person who decided to change their life and go back to school or attend college because of the redirection that was given to them by being a part of a youth jobs. I know that we talk about this budget uh, in frame of numbers and in frame of balance and in frame of the financial health of the city of Boston, but I am incredibly, incredibly heartened by the support that has come for this specific amendment from my council colleagues. I am excited uh, about what we're gonna be able to do with this level of resource. And I just wanted to lift up what the human cost is. We don't always win. We don't always get these amazing young people that we can save. But if $6.9 million means that maybe we lose 15 less young people this summer, then I think that that is an incredibly worthwhile investment. And I am so incredibly happy to support it. And I'm incredibly happy to have the support of my council colleagues. Thank you, Chair, for including us here. Um, and I'm thankful for all of the youth organizers that almost 20 years later <laughs> continue to show up here to tell us that they need resources and that the vision for the city of Boston that they have is one that's not only inclusive but meets every single need of every single young person in the city of Boston. I am a product of the youth justice movement here in the city of Boston. I'm elected here to the city council because the youth justice movement in Boston got behind me and made sure that I got elected. And it is my honor to steward um, this amendment on the city council vote. So I just wanted to thank my colleagues and I wanted to lift up um, the voices of all of the young people in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lara. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? The Chair recognizes Council Baker. Council Baker, mm -hmm. you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, just a quick point of, 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 um, of uh, interest, I guess. So we're voting on, this is where all of our 
and this is for as much as the people at home as it is for us here. We're voting on our amendments now, which is different from the way it used to, correct? Okay. So um, I'm not necessarily in agreement with, with some of the direction of the city, and in, in particular down at Mass and Cass. I think that that's going to be basically a money dump for the next 20 years, and I don't think we're ever going to get in, in front of the, the, the problem. I think the people that are down there, the way they're handling with them, we're putting them on a treadmill, and I, think it's, I, I don't think it's going to get any better. That doesn't say I, I hope it, it, I don't hope it gets better. I do hope it gets better because Mass and Cass now is leaking into every neighborhood around it. My neighborhood, your neighborhood, Lower Roxbury, your neighborhood, not going to get any better. So with that being said, this budget's different in a sense where we, you guys more than me, I think, have been able to add in things that are important to you and important to help your neighborhoods, your districts, and you be able to do your job. So I think that being said is good news. So I will be voting in favor of this operating budget here, anxiously looking at how it comes back. How much of what we did yesterday and the previous days, how much is actually going to come back to us? How much are we going to be able to say we made a difference there, we were there? And quite honestly, I wish that what we did yesterday we did with APA because the APA money is where we can bring things into, into District 4, where we can help out. Everybody knows what I'm looking to do. I'm looking to do the field house. The field house is going to be generational change for people. Generational. There's three housing developments that were within walking distance there. Unable to get any kind of back and forth with this administration on that issue. That would make me want to vote against an operating budget. That would make me want to vote against a, a, a capital budget. Just because of the lack of someone coming and asking me who I am, what I, what I want, what, you know, what do you think, what are your thoughts. Hasn't happened in this, in this budget season for me. $800, billion, $800 million has gone through this floor right here. We haven't had a say on it. None of you have had a say on it. So that, to me, is problematic. It's problematic of what, may, what the future looks like with an administration that's not really going to pay attention to us. You know, they're paying attention now because we had those budgetary amendments and we were able to, we'll see what happens with it. I think the process, because a lot of what we did yesterday, I thought if our one opportunity with APA money being there, we could have filled a lot of those holes with the APA money. I hope what we did didn't go in and raid budgets of city departments. Because I consider myself first, and I've said this a thousand times, I consider myself a, a city worker first. I've got 35 years in the city. I started in real property. I went over to the printing department. And every year around the budget season, it's like, oh, I hope our boss, the, the, the head of the department, is fighting for us, getting us the money we need, getting us, you know, whether if it's, whether if it's you know, cleaning products we needed at the print department, whether if it was, whether if it was, you know, an extra person to come and, and be an extra hand. I hope, I hope we didn't go in and just raid city departments and now they're all going to scramble for a year figuring out how they make that, that work happen where they thought the budget was there. Now we went in and um, are shifting it around. We'll see what happens. I'm, I'm, you know, interested in seeing what happens, but just wanted to get up and make a couple points, especially about APA. This APA here is a, is a missed, missed, missed opportunity. We're just being told where it's gonna, gonna be spent. You'll be good with it, just trust us. Trust but verify. We haven't had a chance to verify. Here, yeah, here's three, 350 million. You guys are okay with it, right? Yeah, just approve it and send it along. That's a problem. Thank you, Mr. President. I will be voting in favor of this because not because of the budget that came from across the hall, because it's the budget that you guys helped to put together, and you guys are going to be able to do things in your districts and in your neighborhoods that are going to help you. Because we know, as counselors, in a smaller, more refined way, I think, what our neighborhoods need more than 
maybe people that are a little bit removed. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Baker. The Chair recognizes Councillor Mejia. Councillor Mejia, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, this budget season has definitely been a learning experience. Two years ago, when I stood up and voiced my opposition to what's then referred to as the mayor's budget, we made it clear that we can't be doing business as usual because this isn't the mayor's budget, it is the people's budget. Um, and with that, since then, the city council, the city councilors have been working, and more importantly, the people, we are now in a position to reflect the voices of the people in our budget process. This first year was a proving ground. It was an opportunity to test the waters of these new powers. Because of that, we have been bold. And we have been sitting through, well, at least the last few working sessions, seven hours to get to where we needed to be under the leadership of this powerhouse over here. I feel I'm six hours, 16 total, but seven hours each. It felt like maybe 24 hours round trip. Um, but I feel really confident in our ability to fight for things that the people have been demanding. A little bit in our process, every year our office holds a series of budget pop-ups in, in community spaces across the city, in barbershops, hair salons, restaurants, schools, you name it. Where there are people, we're there to listen. This year we were able to hear firsthand from residents from across the city about what their priorities are, and through our amendment process we were able to make those priorities a reality. And I also want to shout out um, the advocates who have been working fiercely around youth jobs. And I am so incredibly happy um, that Councilor Lada, um, as someone who has been in deep community with young people, has been able to deliver on these promises. And there's still so much more to do on that front. Um, and I look forward to working alongside her to get some more money <laughs> next year. In one of our pop-ups, we heard firsthand from immigrant business owners about the struggles that they have getting their businesses off the ground. And because of that, we managed to secure you know, $500,000 to do two things. First, we're using some of the funds to create two positions where we'll serve as case managers for immigrant businesses. The rest of the funds will be um, available to small immigrant-owned businesses to access resources like web design, logos, banners, and other technical assistance that immigrant businesses have. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole line item of all the things that we were managed to secure because I think you all will get the memo. And this is not just about the things that we were able to do um, as an office. But I do want to just take a moment to really highlight that this can't be politics as usual. And if the council has been given the power to make amendments, it is really important for the administration, right, to recognize that power and give us the power to do just that, which is to send back the budget with the needs and wants of this council, right? Anything other than that will be completely unacceptable. And I want to go on the record that what this council has approved is what I will be supporting. Period. End of story, and you could rewind. Because this is not the moment for us to say that we want to be collaborative and then send us something that we're going to have to compromise on. And this should not be about the Hunger Games either. Where there is a will, there is a way. And this is an opportunity for us to find the dollars to make it happen. And I want to be really clear as I stand here in support of passing this operating budget that I think this is our responsibility and our, and our opportunity to rise up and give the people, at the very least, the belief that government is working for them. 
And one last thing that I'll say is that I've been echoing this alongside my other colleagues about the OPER funding. Yeah, I am not going to, when it comes to that budget, approve things that we have not really had a real say in. Because there's a lot of money on the table right now and we need more processes and protocols and procedures in place to make sure that we get a piece of that pie too. So with that, I just wanna go in favor and supporting this operating budget and it better come back as is. No, just joking, thank you very much. And Madam, Ch and Madam Chair, like what you did so masterful masterfully, right? It is not easy to work with 13 multiple personalities because we all have them and get us to where we need to be. And I just want you to know that the work that you did to get us here, um, given that this was the first time that we were all doing this, thank you. And thank you to Flaherty and Flynn for feeding us along the way too. <laughs> really do appreciate that because you know I'm a grub. Um, but nah, seriously, let's just make sure that we lean in and we recognize this moment as a collective. Thank you, Madam Chair, for your hard work. Thank you, Council Mejia. The Chair recognizes Councilor Bork. Councilor Bork, Thank you. you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. And um, with your indulgence, I just want to spend two minutes addressing off topic the ARPA question and then turn back to the docket at hand. Um, I want to emphasize to councilors that you know, when the administration filed this ARPA docket, their original hope was that we would also be having an ARPA vote today. That's why it was introduced with the budget. And we are not having an ARPA vote today, precisely because my committee is focused on making sure that counselors get a say in that. Now, folks may have noticed that there hasn't been a lot of legislative time because we have been going through five major dockets that the chair has just spoken about today. And so we have grabbed every possible hearing slot that was available to consider the, the proposal that the administration proposed. Now, I think it's fair to the administration to have gone through in a series of hearings the proposals they put before us, much like Councillor Anderson sat over 30 hearings on the department budgets before we got into working sessions. So it is my hope as the chair of COVID-19 recovery that with hopefully results from today that the Ways and Means Committee is going to be able to release a few holds over to the COVID-19 Recovery Committee so that we can hold some of these working sessions that counselors are clamoring for. But I do not frankly think it is fair to the committee or to myself as chair to suggest that the problem mid-process is that we haven't gotten where we got at the end of a process with budget. So I just, I would really appreciate if counselors would maybe pursue their challenges on this differently. Thank you. Thank, um, thank you. Thank you, Council Buck. And then on Councilor Anderson's uh, docket, and I, I really do want to congratulate her, I just think, um, you know, Councilor Mejia has referenced the fact that a number of us were sort of, you know, here together. We were actually not here, we were on Zoom um, two years ago uh, talking about the budget in 2020 and feeling tremendously frustrated by the, uh, by the tools that the Council had at our disposal and the tools that we did. <clears throat> And at that point, we embarked on this process led by Councillor Edwards, now Senator Edwards, um, to propose, yes, on one, this charter change. Um, and I, I always thought to myself that, you know, I don't know if the council fully knows what we're getting ourselves into. Because what the yes on one charter change did was, yes, it gave the council more power in the budget, but it also gave the council tremendously more responsibility. Um, it is much easier to say, no, no, I don't like, not good enough, than it is to say, here's what would make this better. And to actually put your vote on the line to support something that would make it better. And it's harder because we live in a world that's a work in progress and nothing is ever perfect, right? And so I think that, um, you know, it's a, it is a big responsibility for the council to have taken on. And I also think that once we passed it and we started looking at it, you know, one of the things that you realize is that so much of you know, how we do the business of government, it's not just in the written legal language, it's also in the norms and the institutions. And the reality is that in this budget process, we have been doing something that the council has no prior norms or institutions for. Um, and I just think that in that context, uh, that Councilor Fernandez Anderson has shown tremendous grace in trying to piece that new process together 
um, and really saying, hey, we need to use this. Like, we need to step into this responsibility. Yes, it's going to be a little bit awkward and it's going to involve all of us saying more directly to each other the, the different hopes and dreams we have as opposed to everybody kind of going off and saying it to the mayor's side and, and hoping that they're the ones who are heard. Um, and I think that that is harder work for this body and that it is the work of really the democratic representative governance. And so I'm just, I'm really grateful to Councilor Fernando Sanderson for leading that and for leading us to a point where, as Councilor Baker said today, we have um, an omnibus amendment that's being proposed by the chair, one which I intend to support. Um, I, a couple of things that are particularly exciting for me about that, um, Councilor Lara's not here, but I'll just uh, echo her remarks on, you know, I think the youth jobs are probably marginally one of the most impactful things we do with city dollars. And so I think the call for us to, to meet that commitment in the budget with more further funds um, was important. Um, I also um, was really pleased that, co that colleagues saw fit to include this 2.5 million further increase in addition to the 2.5 that the administration's putting forward for housing vouchers. I think we found that these city housing vouchers are a really great source of um, sort of flexibility for us to help particular vulnerable populations that aren't well served by the feds and the state. And whether we're talking about, you know, the really project facing in IDP, we're talking about our returning citizens, we're talking about undocumented folks, we're talking about how to um, pilot a new home ownership voucher approach that uh, Council Royal has been working on. I think that getting that line item increased in the operating budget is really important. And I think folks know that um, if, if I have had a, a secret mission, not that secret, for the last six years um, since really coming uh, back to Boston, it's been to increase the total amount of housing resources, um, and particularly the total number of resources from the city going to housing. And I think this is another step in that important direction. Um, and then, you know, we've been talking a lot under the mayor's leadership about a Green New Deal. Um, I think there's some amazing amendments in the council's proposal here that are part about making that real. So I'm really excited about the idea of these like eight additional people for parks um, on the tree, the sort of tree maintenance and urban wilds maintenance front. Um, I think that's a constant, speaking to Councillor Baker's point, <coughs> issue for us in our districts. And I also think that as we support the green jobs program that the city is launching, we need permanent parks jobs um, for folks to land in. And, not for nothing, you know, the Parks Department once sat up at like 400 people and now it's at sort of 200 odd. And I just think when we talk about our, um, when we talk about our commitment to being Green New Deal City and all that infrastructure, it needs maintenance, it needs city workers, that's stuff that we should be doing here in-house in the city, not contracting out. And so I feel like this is a really substantial step in that direction. Um, similarly, the support for waste reduction um, work, which the city really needs to accelerate. Um, another person working on open streets, the, um, some, a little bit more support for the Groundwater Trust, which stewards a really important natural resource in my district. These, and across a number of other districts, these just, um, they feel like really important things. And that's why I'm hopeful that, uh, and I think we have reason to be hopeful um, that this, you know, lob across the net by the council will be met with collaboration in the mayor's office. I think that what I, the slightly different tone I would take from Councilor Mejia is just, you know, I do think that there are places here where we can go back and forth collaboratively. What I mean by that is, for instance, we propose that the tree maintenance for people are, you know, in a specific, there are specific like uh, job description. If, if the arborist and the parks commissioner were to come back to the council and say, actually, for the right kind of tree pruning, we need this different description, like I, as a counselor, would be open to that. I think what's nice is that this process has moved that whole conversation into the light, into the public, has let us all kind of like learn along the way about the whys and wherefores. Why is this money available and why is it not? And um, and I'm excited about that process. And, and not for nothing, um, the last two years, each budget season, the argument has been between like the concept of the perfect budget and no budget at all. And I think that's always set us up with a really crummy um, false choice where we're kind of hanging out over a cliff looking at the 112 and saying, is it worth it? Um, and I think that's put everybody in a difficult position. And I like the fact that, you know, with the mayor proposing a budget, with us proposing back this amended budget today, which I hope we will in support of the chair, um, with the mayor then responding and then an opportunity for the council to respond, I think the hope would be that we are working together on perfecting a budget. 
Um, and so I very much look forward to that work ahead and plan to vote in the affirmative. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councillor Bach. The chair, the chair recognizes Councillor Louis-Jean. Uh, Councillor Louis-Jean, you have the floor. This, is, this budget represents historic investments and opportunities to reimagine our city and what city services look like. Uh, kudos to Mayor Wu, this is our first budget. Uh, she's a mayor committed to transforming, redesigning, and rethinking how City Hall works uh, to make it work for the people and for all people, from affordable housing to investments in early childhood, uh, education, and child care. Uh, the mayor has been recognizing the urgency of this moment. Uh, I commend her and her team, uh, including Jim Williamson, budget director, for all their efforts, and also especially for your willingness to listen. Um, I commend uh, Chair Fernand Anderson. I think if nothing, this process has shown how brilliant you are and how you are willing to pour your entire self into this work, not for you, but for the people of Boston and for the people who have often been silenced by our budget and ignored by our budget on whose backs the city has been built. So thank you for that. Um, this has definitely been historic. This is our first time as a city council being able to weigh in. And I, I, as a new city council, wasn't part of the moment where we started thinking about how do we have an influence and an impact. So I also thank all of my colleagues who were here before me who really you know, did the fight uh, to make us have this shared power uh, that the people have given us. Um, these amendments to the city budget help us achieve uh, that shared power, which hopefully will, will translate to more shared prosperity. Um, some things like investing in the Office of Returning Citizens, which we've heard from numerous times both here and in opera hearings, is important uh, to those um, who are formerly incarcerated because that's an office that has never been invested in. It was created and never given the power or the, uh, or, or the capacity to really lean into the work of making sure that our uh, returning citizens and formerly incarcerated folks have space in this city to really thrive. And so investing in that is sending a signal to the administration that we need to look at um, uh, all of our city departments and fund them holistically. Um, the budget with the Council of Amendments are fiscally sound and will lead to transforming how our government shows up for people. It's saying, you know, we need to rein in overtime. And when BPD tells us, I was just went, but went back and looked at their responses to an RFI where I asked, you know, what are the efficiencies? And they talk about all of the things that they're doing to improve uh, the, uh, that expenditure. We should believe them and really hold them to task there. Um, you know, every day is another chance for us to get it right as a city and for us to continue the fight. And so we must continue to push for a budget that invests in building strong communities, and this is a start. I don't know, someone said that, right? This is just the beginning. Um, and, and there are so many great things that we were able to do as a result of these amendment powers. Um, you know, we're still learning, so making mistakes as we go, but I think this was a really great start from funding things like Smart from the Start to the Art Quarter to more Hokies um, so that all of our neighborhoods, including Dorchester and Mattapan, can look um, as good as all of our other neighborhoods, um, to supporting Ladder 13 and Car 5, um, you know, to supporting immigrant businesses, to supporting um, our citizens who um, are immigrant communities who have uh, faced so many stumbling blocks when it comes to becoming citizens. So providing them uh, with the resources to legal assistance and um, has been something that I care deeply about um, so that they can become citizens and, and, and making sure that we are not forgetting our immigrant communities uh, when we're doing this work. So. I'm just really thankful for this uh, shared power that we now are experiencing alongside a mayor who's committed to the work. Thankful again to Chair uh, Fernand Anderson. I will be supporting um, these amendments um, and uh, seeing, uh, looking forward to the work that we'll continue to do here. So thank you. Thank you, Councilor Lujan. Uh, the chair recognizes Councilor Coletta. You have the floor. Thank you, Council President. Uh, I'll start my remarks just by saying that I'm extremely excited that we are now uh, utilizing our uh, new power. I want to thank the mayor and her team for a great first budget. I want to commend my colleagues for welcoming me, welcoming me into this process with patience as I dove right into the thick of it the last three weeks. Um, I especially want to thank you, Madam Chair, um, for shepherding us through this newfound power with grace, authority, and humor at the appropriate times. I think you're mad funny. Um, I am grateful to everybody to have been given, uh, for, to have the opportunity to articulate my priorities and to showcase the power of targeted investments as a statement of our values. Um, and I especially want to uplift and honor now Senator Edwards, who said, let's break this down and change the system. She leaned into the work with Armani White, and those who involved and those who were involved in yes on one for a better budget so i just want to uplift uh, them in this work 
What we are voting on today is historic. Let us not forget the time and energy it took to get us all here and what we've proposed. We do know that some of what's in here is a work in progress. There is still relevant information that needs to be obtained by the administration, and I look forward to working with Mayor Wu and members of her team to iron out the details, especially as it pertains to funds allocated to youth employment and engagement. I do believe that that uh, amendment is needed right now in this moment, and I thank Council Lara for introducing it. What I am most proud of are the significant investments in specific departments and programs that will positively impact East Boston, Charlestown, and the North End. Yay! I'm not gonna get into them, but I do hope that, I hope and pray that the odds are in my favor and they will remain. So I do plan to vote in the affirmative on this, and I look forward to collaborative conversations in the month ahead with the mayor's office. Thank you. Thank you, Council Coletta. The chair recognizes Councilor Murphy. Council Murphy, you. you have the floor. Thank you, President. Um, yeah, so as this was for many of us our first budget season and the first for all of us with the new council powers, I do want to recognize the chair and all of us for the hard work and effort over these past few months. We powered through, and I am pleased with the amendments that we are presenting to the mayor. Increased funding for senior programming in standalone senior centers, increased programming at our community centers for our youth and teens, a big investment in youth jobs, which is very necessary, addressing the rodent problems throughout the city that many businesses and residents deal with in all of our offices, not just Councilor Braden, get lots of calls on them. We all, we all get them, we know. Supporting public safety by bringing back CAR 5, which we know will increase diversity at the top of the department, and also returning Ladder 13, which will bring quicker responses to our South End residents, and also bring more supports to those struggling at Mass and Cass. As the Chair of Veterans and Public Health, I am pleased, I'm most pleased with the increased funding for recovery and mental health services, especially for our veterans and young adults who are struggling not only with mental health emergencies, but also with the opioid crisis. So I will be voting in support of these amendments today, but I do hope the mayor finds other ways than taking from public safety to support these important amendments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Murphy. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? I, I want to take this, take this opportunity to thank the Chair of Ways and Means, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, for the incredible hard work and professionalism that it, she has shown during this budget process. She has worked um, with our colleagues, with the mayor's administration, in a professional manner, in an inclusive manner, in making sure voices are heard and respected in the process. Um, she also has included the public in a robust discussion to make sure the public voice is heard during the budget process as well. It's a difficult job of being the Ways and Means Chair, but Council Fernandez Anderson, you've done an exceptional job leading, leading us during this budget, budget process and budget debate. Um, so I want to acknowledge your incredible work during this, during this, during this time. Um, as, a, as a district councilor from District 2, I'm also concerned about what Councilor Baker has highlighted about the mass and cast area as well, and it certainly impacts my area because I represent the South End and South Boston and Chinatown, and it certainly impacts Councilor Fernandez Anderson, her district as well, Councilor Baker, actually Councilor, Councilor Bach also. We share the same area down towards the, the Boston Garden, which has some challenges, major challenges. Um, so as I, what I would like to see over the next several weeks too, as we vote um, for the final budget, 
I would like to see what services, what programs, what assistance we can provide the area in and around Mass and Cass. Because we know that residents are calling us daily about quality of life issues. And as district city councilors, we don't pass the buck. And we deal with these constituent calls and constituent requests every day. And I want to I want to work with the mayor's administration and team on what services, what programs, what assistance we can further provide to the residents in and around Mass and Cass. And that's certainly Roxbury, the South End, Dorchester, South Boston, Chinatown is further out, but it's 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 impacted. So I'm going to hopefully coordinate and work closely with the with our colleagues but also with the mayor's office as we as we continue this debate about what services are are, in, are critical in the mass and cast area the the quality of life issues that were mentioned already in this budget including pest control including um, inspectors for um, licenses related issues whether it's Airbnb whether it's after hours work construction, whether it is um, <clears throat> other quality of life issues, but it's the nuts and bolts of, of city government is what's important to, to district councils and, and at large councils. Um, but we wanna make sure that these nuts and bolts issues, these basic city services um, in this budget are protected because the quality of life of residents is what's really important for, for all of us. And as we go forward over the next several weeks, I wanna make sure that we continue having a meaningful conversation about quality of life issues, nuts and bolts, city government, city government uh, related issues. So again, just wanna say thank you to Councilor Fernandez Anderson during this period of time. Um, and also, I, I want to highlight my district councilors, particularly, certainly my at-large colleagues, but the district city district council has played a critical role during, during this budget. And we listen to residents, we answer the calls, as did our at-large councilors. Um, but we want to continue to focus on basic city services. I just want to acknowledge one of our, one of our colleagues is Councilor Council Rural for the important work that you've demonstrated during this period of time. So thank you, Council Rural, for bringing a lot of these critical issues to the forefront and for your important work and leadership on the, on the budget as well. Um, <clears throat> would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Council Fernandez Anderson, the chair of the Committee on Ways and Means, seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 0480 in an amended draft. Mr. Clerk, can you please call the roll? Roll call on docket 0480 as amended. Councilor Arroyo? Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker? Aye. Councilor Baker, aye. Councilor Bach? Aye. Councilor Bach, aye. Councilor Braden? Councilor Braden, aye. Councilor Coletta? Yes. Councilor Coletta, yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson? Yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, yes. Councilor Flaherty? Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn? Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Lara? Yes. Councilor Lara, yes. Councilor Lu Yes. Councilor Lu yes. Councilor Mejia? Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Murphy, yes. And Councilor Worrell? Yes. Councilor Worrell, yes. Docket number 0480, as amended, has received a unanimous vote. Thank you. Docket 0480 is passed in an amended draft. We're on to, yeah. Um, the chair recognizes Council Fernandez Anderson. Uh, Council, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, I didn't want to close that uh, 
chapter of this uh, meeting without thanking the administration uh, for their participation in public hearings and for the crucial work behind the scenes, uh, particularly <coughs> G Jim uh, and Johanna and the rest of the budget team, thank you. Um, I am exceptionally grateful for the IGR team. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Claire Kelly, Neil Doherty, and a ve very special thank you to Chantel Barboza. <clears throat> we didn't move any money out of AGR so that you can get a big raise. <laughs> um, I thank you three for your incredible patience, for your incredible um, humility, uh, professionalism. Uh, you were there every step of the way. You did your work. You came, you showed up, you never complained, and uh, you really supported uh, my first year as chair on Ways and Means, and I thank you, and I think we all here thank you. And thank you to my consular colleagues um, for uh, believing in me and for us doing this work together. I really, truly believe that <clears throat> whatever we submitted here for the amendments, we all today submitted all of these amendments. We all have passed, or at least for now, have uh, <laughs> passed this, the recommended um, budget. So I thank you so much, and I look forward to more work. Thank you. Thank you, Council fernandez Anderson. <clears throat> and well stated, and I also would like to echo, especially the comments you mentioned about the Intergovernmental Affairs team. Um, they've been exceptionally professionalism and um, very responsive, so I want to echo what you said in thanking the Intergovernmental Affairs team. Um, we're on to motions, orders, and resolutions, however. I would like to take one, one docket out of, out of order at this time for scheduling issues. So, Mr. Mr. Clerk, can we go to, can we go to 0726? Document number 0726, Councilor Braden, Louisiana, offer the following. Resolution designating June 2022 as LGBTQIA plus Pride Month. The, the chair recognizes Councilor Braden. Councilor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to my colleagues and for your accommodation. I have to leave for an important meeting very shortly, so thank you so much. Uh, May I uh, please seek uh, suspension of the rules in order to add Councillor Bach as an original co-sponsor in addition to myself and Councillor Louis Jean, please? Hearing no objections, uh, Council Bach is so added. I offer this uh, resolution in recognition, celebration and further commitment to the ongoing and very necessary work given June being Pride Month. And as I expressed at the start of the meeting, it is an honor that uh, Peggy of Dignity Boston was able to offer the council blessing today. LGBTQI plus um, individuals, in particular transgender and gender non-conforming individuals, especially those of color, face a disproportionately high risk of becoming victims of violent hate crimes. And in 2022, thus far, there has been at least 14 transgender people fatally shot or killed by, or, or by other violent means. The COVID-19 pandemic has compounded the systemic inequi inequity of the LGBTQI uh, Q plus uh, individuals face in healthcare, employment and housing systems across the United States, which has led to a disproportionate, a disproportionate impact on this community and, and uh, as individuals. Recently, the city has made strides towards attaining further equity for LGBTQ plus members of our community with the Mayor's inaugural Office of LGBTQ plus Advancement, tasked with developing policies and community-oriented programming. We will provide resources for the city's multicultural, multi-generational uh, and multilingual LGBTQ plus community. Uh, we are very excited to welcome Quincy Roberts as the Executive Director leading the office to empower and protect and advance the rights and dignity and of the LGBTQ plus residents across the city. And I invite my colleagues on the City Council and across the City Departments to commit to furthering the values of Pride Month, not just in June. 
but as an interdisciplinary approach to ensuring the needs of the LGBTQ plus folks um, are integrated into city and constitu constituent services through an equity lens. Pride Month is a recognition that there is more work to do to enshrine civil rights protections and build a future for all individuals, especially our LB LGBTQ plus um, brothers and sisters um, and transgender community. And while we celebrate pride in our, in, in our community's existence, resilience and achievements to date, we must commit, re recommit to the work that still lies ahead. As I mentioned last year when I spoke about this, I, I had never experienced a pride celebration in my life until I came to Boston. And in, in, in June of uh, 1996, I, uh, I attended the interfaith service at uh, Old South Church. And uh, I'd never been in a house of worship that recognized me, saw me, and celebrated my existence. And I sat there and cried. And I'm going to cry again today. But I sat there and cried as I saw this incredible outpouring of, of, of uh, warmth and support for the LGBTQI, um, Q plus, I keep saying I, um, community in Boston. And I was, I had, you know, I was sitting there, the tears rolling down my cheeks and this really nice Irish guy from Dorchester was, was keeping me, handing me the tissues and holding my hand and I was going like, this is incredible. And then I walked out the door and, uh, I bump into the mayor of Boston with a police color guard, an LGBTQ uh, color guard, and I'm going like blown away. Like I come from Northern Ireland, where you went on a pride parade and you had a bag over your head because you didn't want to be recognised, because you could lose your job, uh, you could be discriminated against, you could be physically abused and assaulted. It was very different. And but I also want to say that in this moment, with the uh, with the attack on. Uh, the woman's right to choose and, 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 and have access to uh, comprehensive uh, women's health care, including an abortion. There's, there's, a movement in this, and, and there's a movement in this country to sort of push us back into the shadows. There's a movement in this country to make us go back into the closet and hide. And there's a movement in this country that tries to not, not give us our rights as, as, as equal citizens. So I really feel that in this moment we have to reaffirm our commitment to recognizing our LGBTQ um, plus brothers and sisters and really um, dig in and, and affirm the dignity of all human beings, but especially this, the members of this community in, in this moment. So I thank my co-sponsors uh, for joining me in this and I ask the uh, City Council to support this resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Council Braden. The chair recognizes Council uh, Louis-Jean. Um, Council Louis-Jean, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and I want to thank you, um, Councilor Braden, for thinking of me and adding me to this, and I want to thank you for the grace that you, both you and your partner have showed to me from the very beginning. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, this, for me, in this space, um, actually has, has a lot of meaning because in my early 20s, um, uh, my friends and I were, I think, I've, I've told this story before, were thrown out of a nightclub in Boston because we were black. Um, and um, it really was a jarring experience for me. You know, we faced discrimination, of course, as black people trying to attend nightlife or go to clubs in Boston, but never to the extent that we experienced it that night. And I remember, uh, you know, then Councilor Presley finding out about it and asking me to come testify before city council. Um, and I was sitting here, I, I, uh, and I remember it very clearly. I was sitting right where uh, Councilor Lara was sitting and next to me, um, and it was just a, it was a panel about discussion about discrimination in the city of Boston. And next to me was um, a trans activist who talked about his experience of discrimination in the city of Boston. And after I gave my testimony, I really forgot what I said because of how much um, I had learned from uh, the person sitting next to me. And that person is someone who has continued to be someone in my life that I think about and reach out to um, when it comes to issues affecting um, our LGBTQ plus community. I came here uh, you know, sharing information about my own experience and left really understanding how intersectional all of our issues are and how interdependent we are all on each other for our, for our freedom. And so um, 
that sitting here in the city council more than a decade or so ago um, and, and having come in full circle and co-sponsoring this resolution means a lot to me. Um, you know, uh, a person who sits next to me no longer lives here in Boston, but I reach out to him from time to time to just, you know, tell him about the work that we're doing here on the council um, and how um, just influential he was um, in, in, in elevating the needs of all the communities really that um, are too often sidelined and silenced here, but particularly the LGBTQ plus community and for, and for him, the trans community here, coming off of last weekend where on City Hall there was a celebration of liberation for our trans community led by trans, uh, wonderful uh, trans activists and, and folks here. Um, I just am so grateful that we have such voices elevating issues that matter most to our LGBTQ plus community. Um, and I, I, I think, you know, Quincy Roberts, who's going to do an amazing job at the Office of LGBTQ Plus Advancement, Chastity Bowman, who helped put on uh, the Celebration of Liberation uh, that honored uh, leaders in the community like uh, Grace and, and Tiasha and so many people who pour out uh, so much of themselves to make sure um, that uh, especially our trans women, our trans women of color um, are centered when we're talking about issues of health and housing. So. Um, you know, this is a month of celebration and there's so much to celebrate, um, but it's also uh, a reminder of the work that we have to do. And so I hope to always show up as an ally in the work and to be a good ally and to be re-steered when, we, you know, allies need re-steering. Um, and I just um, am grateful for the opportunity to, to co-sponsor this resolution. So thank you, Council Braden. Thank you, Council Lujan. Um, the Chair recognizes Council Bork. Council Bork, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. President, and thank you so much to Councillor Braden um, for inviting me to join you and Councillor Lujan um, as a co-sponsor. Um, and I think, as you've already heard from my colleagues, that you know this is a moment where we uh, intermingle joy with a sense of danger and a need for um, renewed resolve and on behalf of our LGBTQIA plus community. Um, I, uh, I have to say that it's a community that's very special to me. I think that um, I think I might be one of uh, one of sort of the first generation of American kids to ever grow up in a majority LGBTQ community. Um, I grew up in Bay Village, also known uh, sometimes as Gay Village. Um, it was this. It was the overflow of the South End's gay community at a time where that community um, was still stigmatized, still living in the shadows, still, to Councilor Louis Jen's point, trying to create um, spaces of their own where they could be themselves um, and. And what's so interesting for me is that I didn't know that initially growing up. What I knew was the tremendous community of love that these people had structured um, because our LGBTQ parents were not mostly able to adopt and be parents yet. It meant that I had all of these kind of aunts and uncles growing up in Bay Village looking out for me. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and just getting to know belonging to a church that was one of the first um, kind of LGBTQ um, friendly churches in the city and uh, and getting to know sort of the uh, gay softball league as a norm and kind of like growing up in this context of joy and then only as later as an adult really, you know, talking with and learning from these like, you know, uh, mentors of mine in the community and really understanding, oh, when, you know, when we founded that softball league we lost half the team to AIDS one year, right? And you know when those like places that were, we used to um, have the Bay Village uh, Neighborhood Association Christmas party um, in a gay club um, uh, in Napoleon, and just understanding that those spaces had not even been allowed, had been shut down by the police, um, were not uh, places that people could be. It just it it always reminds me that we've come that whole distance even just in my lifetime, um, even though I wasn't as aware of it when I was a kid. Um, what I was aware of was the, the tremendous love and um, mutual support that the LGBTQIA community built up um, around each other um, and so many others at a time when our systems were not stepping up. And so I think it's a huge thing when the official systems step up, when we get something like the LGBTQ um, office that the, uh, that the mayor's founding um, and that we're funding in this budget, not to, you know, it, I think it's worth saying that the budget that we voted on today includes the first funding for such an office and that one of the council amendments um, that we just uh, supported was to increase it even further. Um, 
but I also think that that structural, uh, those structural wins are hard won and they're not secure, as Councillor Braden said. They're not secure nationally. Um, and, uh, and I just, uh, in my last, I would say, like 15 years, have gotten to know so many trans individuals who still really bear the brunt um, of a very similar experience and an experience that unfortunately has not become better of what our you know, other folks in the gay community were experiencing 30 years ago. And so I just really wanna say in this pride, like uh, let's recommit ourselves like both to that fight and, and to the, the um, joy and incredible upwelling of love and, um, and tremendous example that the LGBTQ uh, community gives us. And, and I wanna just shout out, I, I try to always shout out in these contexts here in City Hall, the employee resource group here, because they're doing so much um, to support all of our employees. Um, everyone knows uh, Emily Brown, my chief of staff, is on the executive committee, um, along with a number of other really fantastic uh, folks. And I just want to stress that even here in City Hall, we have a significant number of LGBTQIA plus um, employees who are who are not out. You know, and I think that that it's just a testament to the fact that we have to not just be supportive in what we see as LGBTQ spaces. We have to be supportive and welcoming and building these structures of acceptance um, in, in all of the spaces that we are in all of the time. So hoping to rededicate myself to that in Pride Month. And thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Buck. Um, the Chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to the sponsors. This is so, uh, this is the first time on my council that I am not one of the co-sponsors of this, so I just really want to rise and support um, to just share my deep gratitude um, for this uh, resolution that's being put forth today. Um, as someone who started my career in youth development, I had the amazing privilege of working um, with Grace at Bagley and so many other nonprofit organizations that taught me so much about what it looks like to be truly embraced. Um, and what the real meaning of all means all was really all about, um, especially for so many young people who are experiencing so much here in the city of Boston. Um, so I just wanted to add my name, and I also wanted to uplift um, my staff, um, and in particular, Jacob de Blake Court, who has taught me so much about what it means to be a fierce advocate for the LGBTQ community here, so much so that when we filed um, a resolution around reproductive rights. Um, Jacob was so incredibly adamant about making sure that we talk about um, being gender inclusive of that language. And so when you think about the work that needs to be done here on the council, and you think about the, the, the staff that is behind so much of that work, it is important for us to recognize that we're only as good as the staff that we have. And when we have staff who are living the realities and doing the work, um, that we are better for that. So just want to give a shout out um, to, to all of the efforts that my team makes every single day for us to make sure that we show up. Um, so please add my name. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? The, the chair, would anyone like to add the name? Please raise your hand. Mr. Clerk, please add Council Arroyo, Council Baker, Councilor Coletta, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, Council Flaherty, Council Lara, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Murphy, please add the chair. Councilor Braden, Councilor Luajen, and Councilor Bork seek suspension of the rules and adoption of docket 0726. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed nay. The ayes have it. The resolution has been adopted. Congratulations. Um, Mr. Clerk, we're going, we're going to 0723. Um, Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0723. Document number 0723, Councilors Louis Jen and Flaherty offer the following. Order for a hearing on fire and emergency disaster relief services in the city of Boston. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Louis Jen uh, Council Luajen, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to ask that we suspend Rule 12 so that I could add uh, Braden as a third and original co-sponsor, Council he Braden. Hearing no objection, Council Braden is so, so adamant. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I, I believe it was you, Mr. President, who just spoke about you know us getting the, the nuts and bolts of city government right. And so this hearing order really is about that. Oh, sorry, I'm not speaking. Oh, I pressed it. Um, so this hearing order really is about getting that right. Um, you know, every day, you know, too often in the city of Boston, we have our residents who are displaced because of fire. Um, you know, one of my early cases as an attorney was helping a family navigate uh, the experience of, uh, of losing their home to a fire um, and really working with the city departments to uh, get that client shelter really taught me a lot, but not just shelter, um, access to resources, making sure that they were close enough to the hospital that one of her children went to so that he could receive dialysis. There was so much involved in, in once a family is displaced from a fire. Oftentimes, landlords that are required to maintain insurance um, don't do that, um, and they're supposed to be able to provide relocation benefits to their tenants, but that doesn't always happen. Um, and so this hearing order is about figuring out how we get it right, how do we show up for our uh, vulnerable residents who face fires, you know, analyze Boston's fire incident reporting system, doesn't have any quantifiable, quantifiable data on the injuries or displacement numbers. Um, and we know the city of Boston has an emergency assistance fund for victims of fire, um, that we need to do more work uh, uh, to make sure that we're supporting all of our residents. There, were recent, there was recently a fire in Mattapan and there were uh, young leaders from the Mattapan uh, teen center that held a bake sale uh, because we were falling short as a city in providing for this family. Uh, there have been multiple occasions where families who had nowhere to go showed up in our office. Shout out to my chief of staff, Emily, who is, you know, does a great job at triaging such issues. But we have to do better at providing the basic city services to our residents who are experiencing fire. So this hearing order is about bringing our ci different city departments together to make sure that we're providing adequate city services, that we are uh, using this emergency assistance fund that we have and looking at the model in Cambridge. Cambridge has um, a fund that, um, City of Cambridge has a fire relief fund that residents, public and private entities and others can donate into in order to assist those facing displacement and fire. Um, this is not by no means to supplant the work that's done in community um, to really help those who, are, who, uh, who face fires, but it's really to try to bring all those resources together and so that we ha maximize our impact on our families that um, experience fires, um, especially for our tenants who are renting and renting in subpar units uh, often uh, feel this the most. So um, thank you so much to my co-sponsors, Councilor Flaherty and Councilor Braden, um, and I look forward to this hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lu uh, The chair recognizes Council Flaherty. Council Flaherty, you have the floor. And I'll be brief, obviously, that I uh, appreciate the uh, lead sponsor's inclusion uh, of me on this as a co-sponsor. Done a lot of work in the space and not quite sure whether or not it's part because uh, folks at ISD uh, give folks uh, my name and number or if it's the board of companies that do it. But nonetheless, uh, we uh, are oftentimes in the middle of this working either with the landlords or uh, more particularly the tenants, uh, particularly those that don't have tenant insurance. So. Um, more needs to be done, I think, in the space. Anytime an incident like this happens, more often than not, uh, individuals or families, they lose everything uh, in a fire, and they're starting from scratch. And so anything we can do, assisting them with housing, uh, working closely with uh, neighborhood services, working closely with inspectional services, all of those um, different agencies and organizations and resources, uh, we have a responsibility to do that for residents. And so uh, with that, look forward to uh, an expedited hearing to find ways that we, uh, as a council, can continue to help individuals uh, who are displaced uh, due to fire uh, and or uh, those that have lost everything uh, in an effort to help them get back on their feet and find resources so they can keep a roof over their head and start to get back to uh, life as they knew it prior to the fire. Thank you, Mr. President, and look forward to working with my colleagues. Thanks Thank you. again to uh, Council Lujan. Thank you, Council Flaherty. The Chair recognizes Council Baker. Council Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. G just please sign me on here as a district city council. This is unfortunately something that we come across too often. We only offer these families that are displaced in the street one week worth of um, housing. We need to offer more than that. But also, Council Flaherty had mentioned the board up, the boarding up companies. Just a heads up to people that are district city councils or the at large for that matter. 
they are the pariah in this here. If you go to a fire, you see them all standing with their clipboards. They use that as an opportunity to, to put a lien on those properties. So just so people know it, when you're on the scene and you see the guys with the clipboards there, they're looking to steal the house. Most of the time, looking to steal the house from the people that are watching it burn right now. So just so people put in the back of their minds. And please sign my name. Thank you, Council Baker. Um, is anyone else looking to speak on this matter? Would anyone like to add their name, if you could raise your hand? Mr. Clerk, please add um, Council Royal, Council Baker, Council Ball, Council fernandez Anderson, Council Lara, Council Mejia, Council Murphy, please add the chair. Originally, originally I was going to place this docket into the into the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice, um, but after further discussion and um, consideration, I'm going to place this in um, City Services and Innovation Technology. Thank you. Um, Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0724. Docket number 0724, Councilor Mejia offered the following. Order for a hearing on an audit for Boston Public Schools Special Education Services and return on investment. <coughs> Thank you. Um, the chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Yes, Councilor uh, President Flynn, I know that my colleague has um, one of my co-sponsors, uh, also has a time commitment. So given the fact that I've blabbed on a lot today, I would like to ask if you would be willing and my co-sponsors who are gonna be joining me would be willing to allow us to bring, give, give my colleague an opportunity to talk about both dockets. I know I said no at the beginning and now I'm switching it up just because of time. I didn't know that we would be here until four o'clock today. Mm -hmm. So with that said. Mm -hmm. Mr. Clerk, please read um, the, the added docket, please. Docket number 0725, Councilor Mejia offered the following, order for a hearing regarding the Boston Public Schools transportation system. The chair recognizes Council Mejia. President Council, President Flynn, like to see why you're so dope. Thank you. I appreciate your grace. Thank you. And I want to thank my co well, let me first read this because y'all need to know who my co-sponsors are, right? So thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to um, suspend the rules and, have, and add Councillor Lada and Councillor Anderson to uh, join me as co-sponsors for the special education one. For, for docket 07, for, okay, for 0724, Councillor Lara and Councillor Fernandez Anderson are, are added uh, hearing no objections. Okay, thank you. I'm going to read the second one that I am um, for uh, 0725. Um, I would like to suspend the rules and add Councilor Lada and Murphy uh, on as co-sponsors. Hearing no objection, Councilor Lara and Councilor Murphy are so added. Okay, great. Okay, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to do this uh, with both. Um, I'm going to need a little bit of technical assistance here, but really quick. Uh, with the audit for the Boston Public Schools Education Services and return on investment. This is where I believe the moment in time that we've been talking about as it relates to Boston Public Schools, this is where we have an opportunity to really lean in and support um, through real meaningful partnerships with the council and our, and our ability to help support and hold ourselves and the, um, the district accountable to providing oversight that will ensure that the money that we are approving to be spent are going to be spent um, and that we're gonna see the return on those investments as it relates specifically to um, the BPS budget and the supports for special education services. You know, according to BPS, as of October 2020, there are about 11,350 students aged three to 21 with disabilities, 20, 1% of our total enrollment. Enrolled in special education programs and BPS. The FY23 recommendations budget for special education was over 351 million. Many advocates and administrators agree at this point, it's not the question of resources. 
We are resource rich but coordination poor. And students across the district are not having, uh, many of not having their IEP met, um, IEP needs met. Staffing rates making it difficult to provide a full range of services. Transitions at the top making it a bigger challenge to provide strategic vision to help support and provide care and services to our students. Um, so we're filing this hearing order because the conversation on how we support our special education students cannot begin and end with a budget. Like really, this is where I oftentimes believe that we fall short. I look forward to this conversation and to working alongside my colleagues who both have been fierce advocate in the education space. And then the, the last thing that I'll say in terms of transportation, I myself as a parent have gotten over 25 notifications between January to uh, May that my daughter's school bus was either going to be delayed or not going to show up at all. Luckily, I have resources and a, and a village that helps support me. Um, but I've also have received countless of, of communication from other parents with their frustration and uh, their level of uh, just uh, content for the way we are doing business as it relates to the transportation situation. We spend roughly 10% of our entire BPS budget on transportation and over 110 million in FY23 alone. That's over 4 million that we spent last year and we're busing fewer students than we did last year. The Boston Public School Transportation team has struggled with hiring bus driver retention problems which has led to busing being late or not arriving at all. Um, and we also have seen how this has impacted our out of school athletic events. It is clear that we need to take a deeper dive into the BPS transportation without all the flashy PowerPoint presentation and jargon. This conversation needs to be live beyond the budget season. And I believe that if we could um, really do this work and lean in and figure out how we can be partners um, and being able to help hold BPS accountable, but also hold ourselves accountable to their success, then only then will we really be able to move the needle. So I look forward to joining my colleagues in this robust conversation. And I look forward to the president's recommendation on what happens after I speak, because I changed it up on you. So thank, you thank, thank you, Council Mejia. On docket 0724, um, the chair recognizes Council Lara. Council Lara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. And um, in the interest of time, I'm only going to be speaking once on both dockets. Um, so at this point, everybody here on the council and people across the city have heard me speak um, in support of not only our Boston Public Schools, but against specifically state receivership. Naming specifically that I believe that Mayor Wu, the city council, the incoming superintendent, and soon the elected school committee should be given the opportunity to fix the problems that we have in our schools. Um, and really do the work to make them joyful places of learning that we know that they can be. This is a moment for the council to be in solidarity, not only with the parents, the students, the teachers, uh, and the administrators at BPS, but also with the mayor's office and stand against state takeover of our public schools. And for me, solidarity is a verb. So I consider this to be an all hands on deck project. And you know, my colleague, um, Council Flaherty, often says that we need to have both hands on the wheel. And this is the moment where we need to have both hands on the wheel. That if we're gonna pass this budget and we're gonna make sure we're asking to be given the opportunity to do the work, that we have to do the work. That we have to make sure that our schools are functioning at the level that they're supposed to, that our investments are going in the places that they need to, and that we, not the state, have the opportunity to come up with the solutions that are gonna be necessary for our children. Uh, my son Zaire is autistic. He's a special needs student at BPS. He's six years old going into first grade and similar to um, my co-sponsor, Counselor Mejia, oftentimes the bus is late or it doesn't show up. And I'm grateful that I have a car that I can drive him to school, 
but everybody here has had to pay the price of me being late to a hearing <laughs> or not being able to show up at all because of it. And so I am in support of our public schools, not because I think that they're perfect, but because I know that we're gonna be able to come up with the best solutions possible to fix those issues. As one of, I think, only two people on the council that have students who are currently in BPS, the decisions that we make here very, very much directly impact me and my family. And so I want us to be thoughtful and I want us to be gracious, but I also want us to put both hands on the wheel, which is why I'm excited to do this work with Councilor Mejia as the chair of the Education Committee at the helm. Thank you. Th thank you, Councilor Lara. The chair recognizes on docket 07224, Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, thank you for the president. And thank you to uh, my origin the original co-sponsor on this docket and my co-sponsor, Councilor Lara, as well. Um, it is incredibly vital that we provide first-class, high-quality um, special education ser services. Um, however, for us to know the nature of these problems, uh, whether the money being put towards said programs and services is being well spent, we need more information. Um, we all have anecdotal story stories that great of great successes or horrific failures in this area, and those are not uh, to be dismissed. Um, but what is needed is a comprehensive, concrete breakdown of services provided, the costs of services provided and the positive impact or lack thereof. And um, that the student acquired by assessing um, the services. And I say this knowing that we cannot analyze this data in a vacuum. For there are a variety of socioeconomic issues that are influencing and Im impacting our youth but it is imperative that we gain a better understanding and what services our youth are being offered. I thank you again, um, the original co-sponsor, and thank you um, and look forward to this work. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Councilor Fernandez Anderson. The chair recognizes Councilor Murphy. Councilor Murphy. Thank you, um, President Flynn. So our office gets countless calls and emails from concerned parents that their children are being stranded at bus stops. We get these calls several times a week. We have 22,000 students on buses each day, yet on average 2% of these students, around 442 children are not picked up, forcing them to arrive late or miss school entirely. That may seem like a small number, but one child is too many to be left at a bus stop. To make matters worse, most of our students that are on buses and have one-to-one -one monitors are on IEPs and are our ESL students. These vulnerable students benefit the most from our schools, but with our transportation problems, we fail these students and the families. This is why I'm happy to co-sponsor this motion for a hearing in regards to the Boston Public Schools transportation system in hopes that this ongoing problem is not only addressed, but also starts to get solved so that our students and families don't have to lose out. I also want to mention that we also have heard in the news and many calls our office also gets is about the buses in the afternoon that are stranding our very few students who participate in athletics and they're missing sports and other teams also have to forfeit games because we're unable to get our student athletes to events. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Council Murphy. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? I, I would like to briefly state that I think this is an important, both, both are important hearings. Um, especially services for special education in our public school system. Um, you know, I, I, I wanted to highlight my sister's, my sister's um, son also is a special needs child out of, out of, out of Braintree. Um, and I know the critical role that special education plays in the lives of families and I also no, Council Lara has been exceptional on this issue, as, as all my colleagues, including Council Murphy, too, educating, educating so many children. Um, and, I, and I highlight my, my nephew because my, my parents have watched him for about three or four days a week, usually, 
uh, when my sister's working, um, but they're, they're not able to do it anymore just because of their, my, my parents have not been feeling well, but I, I do know the um, incredible role that parents and grandparents play in educating our special needs children and our parents and parents like Council of Laura, they're, they're really um, unsung heroes in our city of, of the love and compassion they provide so many, um, so many children, including, including our um, Boston Public School teachers as well. So I just want to highlight the incredible role families play on this issue. Um, so on docket 0724, uh, would anyone would anyone like to add their name on on docket zero seven two four? Please raise your hand. Please add Councillor Arroyo Park. Her name is Anderson. Lujan Mejia Murphy, the chair. Docket zero seven two four will now be added to the committee on education. Mr. Clerk, we're going on to zero seven two five. What's that? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, and on docket 0725, uh, please raise your hand if you'd like to be added. Um, hey, Councilor Bach, Councilor Royal, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, Councilor Lujan, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Murphy, and the chair. Um, Councilor Mejia, the chair recognizes Councilor Mejia. Councilor Mejia, yes. you have the floor. Thank you, President. I'll have to stand up. Um, thank you. I just wanted to ask if it's possible to put it into the Government Accountability and Transparency Committee because what I really want to do is start moving a lot of the conversations that we're having about the budget and supports and BPS to the post audit and that is what the committee is set up for is to do to talk about post auditing and transparency and so I just would like to advocate that that specific these two um, dockets are more in regards to transparency and accountability, even though they're education-related items. So I just want to ask if that would be possible. Thank you. Okay. Thank, um, thank, thank you, Council Mejia. Um, we did discuss earlier that it could go to either committee, but having heard your recommendation, uh, we will assign it um, to your committee, Council Mejia. So, government, um, Mr. Chair, please um, assign it to Government Accountability Transparency. and Transparency Committee on, on, on docket 0724 and on docket 0725. Okay. We are, we are on. Okay, we're on, we're on to personnel orders. <laughs> Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0727. Docket number 70727, Councilor Flynn for Councilor Fernandez Anderson. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules, passage of docket 0727. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay, the ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0728. Docket number 0728, Councilor Flynn for Councilor Coletta. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules, passage of docket 0728. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay, the ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0729. Docket number 0729, Councilor Flynn for Councilor the Fernandez. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0729. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay, the ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0730. Docket number 0730, Councilor Flynn for Councilor Baker. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0730. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it, the docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0731. Docket number 0731, Councilor Flynn for Councilor Baker. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0731. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay, the ayes have it, the docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0732. Docket number 0732, 
Docket number 0732, Council of Flynn for Council of Louisiana. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 0732. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read Docket 0733. Docket number 0733, Council of Flynn for Council of Louisiana. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 0733. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read Docket 0734. Docket number 0734, Council of Flynn offer the following. Order for the appointment of temporary employees. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 0734. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay, the ayes have it, the docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0735. Docket number 0735, Council of Flynn offer the following. The Chair Order. seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0734. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay, the ayes have it, the docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0736. Docket number 0736, Council of Flynn offer the following. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 0736. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket <coughs> is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read Docket 0737. Docket number 0737. Council Flynn offered the following. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 0737. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read Docket 0738. Docket number 0738, Council of Flynn for Council of Flaherty. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 0738. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read Docket 0739. Docket number 0739, Council of Flynn for Council of Flaherty. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 0739. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read Docket 0740. Docket number 0740, Council of Flynn for Council Flaherty. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 0740. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Late files. We're now moving on to late files. I'm informed by the clerk that there are two late file matters. The late file. Now moving on to late files, I'm informed by the clerk that there are two late file matters. The late file matters include two personnel orders. Um, the late file matters should be on everyone's desk. We will now take a vote to add these items into the agenda. All those in favor of adding the late file matters, matters into the agenda, say aye. Aye. Thank you. The late file matters have been added to the agenda. Mr. Clerk, please read docket. Please read the first late file matter, which is a personnel order regarding central staff. Filed on June 7, 2022, by Council of Council President Flynn. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of the first late file matter. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The first late file matter has passed. Mr. Clerk, please read the second late file matter, which is the personnel order from Councilor Coletta. Personnel order filed by Councilor Flynn for Councilor Coletta. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of the of this late file matter. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The, the, this late file matter has been passed. We're on to green sheets. Anyone wishing to remove a matter from the green sheets may do, may do so at this time. The chair recognizes Council of Royal. Thank you. Council of Royal, you have the floor. Thank you, Council President Flynn. I will make this brief, but I am pulling uh, docket uh, 505, which is on page 10 of the green sheets. Mr. Clerk, will you please read Docket 0505 into the record? It, it, as as Council Royal mentioned, it should be on page 12. Yes. On uh, uh, page 10. Uh, from the Committee on Government Operations, Docket Number 0505. Message in order for your approval a home rule petition to the General Court entitled Petition for a Special Law regarding an act relative to creation of a branch of the Boston Public Library within an affordable housing development at parcel R-1 in the South Cove Urban Renewal Area in the Chinatown section of the City of Boston. Mr. Mr. Clerk, um, Mr. Clerk, can you please poll the committee members to see if, if they would allow the docket to come before the body? Members of the Government Operations Committee, Council Arroyo. 
Yes. Councilor Louis Jen. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Councillor Royal, Councillor Mejia, yeah. Councillor Bach, yes. Councillor Flaherty, and Councillor Colette. Coletta. The, the, the docket 0505 is now properly before the body. Council Royal, you have the floor. Thank you, Council President Flynn. Uh, this home rule petition would allow the Boston Redevelopment Authority doing business as the Boston Planning and Development Agency to ground lease the BPDA owned vacant land to a developer selected by our RFP process using state and federal funds to fund the development of affordable housing. Because of the limited buildable land in Chinatown, this project would create a space that would be conveyed to the Boston Public Library, creating the much awaited Chinatown Branch Library within this development. The passage of this docket relies on very much the same issues that were faced by docket 0707. You might remember that from like four hours ago, regarding an extremely structured sub-bid process. However, also constructing a library within a nonprofit development requires exceptions from the Commonwealth's contract procurement and award laws. So due to the matter of urgency with the state legislature ending their sessions in July, as chair of the government operations committee, I seek suspension of the rules to pass 505, which will hopefully, uh, with passage and with passage to the state house, bring us the Chinatown branch library. Thank you, Council Royal. Council Royal moves for passage of docket 0505. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0505 has passed. The chair recognizes. Oh, no, sorry. Okay, okay. Anyone else like to remove anything from the green sheets? We're, we're on to the consent agenda. Consent agenda. I had been informed by the clerk that there are no additions to the consent agenda. The chair moves for the adoption of the consent agenda as presented. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you. The consent agenda has been adopted. We're on to announcements. Anyone have any announcements at this time? The chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Um, thank you, Councilor President um, Flynn. There are many people who have contributed to um, contributed in a fundamental and foundation, foundational way to the history of hip hop. But there are very few figures who have impacted our music to the same extent as Lawrence Parker. Who is Lawrence Parker, you ask? He is none other than KRS-One, a powerful rapper, lyricist, and producer who has been active since the mid-1980s. When he initially rose to prominence as a member of the group Boogie Down Productions, his socially significant and lyrical provocative cla classics include such essentials as Sound of, the, Sound of the Police and My Philosophy, among many others. KRS-One has made 42 albums, with the latest coming out this year, um, 42 albums? <laughs> That's a catalog. He has been a major influence in hip hop culture in Boston, namely with local Roxbury rap artist Guru from Gangster and Gangsta and Ed Og from the Egg Og and the Bulldogs. He has worked tirelessly to sustain the art form of rap and the culture of hip hop and its five elements. His contribution to arts, culture, and community has spanned 35 plus years. Karis One is one of my favorites. I'm not gonna start rapping. Um, and I am excited that he will be in Roxbury this weekend <laughs> at Black Market Nubians Buy Back the Block Annual Block Party. I'd like to th um, officially thank Kai Grant from the Black Market um, for putting this together for her tremendous work in activism in the arts and culture in Nubian Square and Roxbury at large. Um, and I look forward to seeing all of you this weekend. Thank you. <laughs> Just so in case y'all didn't know, <laughs> in case y'all didn't know, y'all need to hear it and y'all need to pay some respect to our work. <laughs> you ready? Well, y'all not gonna get up? <laughs> Thank, 
Thank you, Council. Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. The chair recognizes Councilor Bach. Council Bach, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I imagine um, that there will be an opportunity for us to do this even more fulsomely, but I just, I, I couldn't let us get to almost five o'clock uh, this day without just acknowledging uh, Julady Valdez, who has just been just such a tremendous um, executive director for the council, and who I want to say is the first representative of the Boston City Council staff who I ever met. Um, I came in uh, to do a little bit of part-time work for Councillor Anissa Sabi george and I wandered in with my paperwork trying to figure out how to sign up, and uh, Angelita was the first welcoming face that I met, and she just has been so um, endlessly helpful and warm, and, uh, and I think really man manages to keep her balance in uh, a context in which um, she has kind of 13 bosses, and as was alluded to earlier, we're all slightly crazy. Um, and so I just think that um, it, it just, like, everything you've done for the council, I got to see it when I was a staffer here, um, and I've also seen it, obviously, on the other side as a counselor, and just, um, it's, it's so much more work than officially is in the job description, um, and we're just so incredibly grateful, and it's really gonna be our loss with you moving on from the council. So I just wanted to say that. Well, well, well stated, Councilor Block representing the entire body with those with those comments about Jalady and we, we wish her the best of luck and success and we know she's done an outstanding job working here as the staff director. So well stated um, Councilor Bach on representing the body. Um, we are we are now on to well anyone else have any um, announcements they want to make? We, we are on to memorials. Um, we're going to adjourn today's memory for the following. Council for the Chair, Louise Maria Ponte, William Fitzgerald, Council Worrell, Andrew Reed, from the entire body, George Howitt, who was with Boston Transportation and do it for 35 years. A moment of silence, please. <clears throat> the chair moves that when the council adjourns today, it does so in memory of those mentioned. We are scheduled to meet again in the Ionella Chamber on Wednesday, June 8th at 12 noon. I want to thank the city clerk and I want to thank city council central staff all those in favor of adjournment, please say aye. aye. The council is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.